Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Disinformation Pandemic Webinar organized by Ubic Webinars. My name is Vladka Roris, and I will be the moderator today. We all live now in a very difficult time caused by the global coronavirus pandemic. But this is not the only issue. We live in disinformation pandemic as well. It's not easy sometimes to distinguish what is real and what is fake, as the online world is the breeding ground for the spread of misinformation. Misinformation uh, is causing polarization, mistrust, and even endangers the public health. So what should we do about it? We have invited today six experts from different parts of the world, and they will share their experiences and suggestions. Before that, I would like to emphasize that we want to make this webinar as interactive as possible. So we will use the poll function and I will launch one poll at this moment to keep you guys engaged from the very beginning. So please answer those questions. And in the meantime, I will go over the agenda and housekeeping rules. Just a detail, these polls are not visible for the YouTube viewers. As I mentioned in the beginning, we have six speakers today from the US, UK, India, Belgium, Turkey, and Georgia. And the webinar will open Mrs. Anneli Ahonen, who is head of East Stratcom Task Force at European External, External Action Service. And she will speak about the US response against foreign disinformation related to COVID-19. After that, Mr. John Mitchell will improve our critical thinking and will speak about how to spot a conspiracy theory and how to live in a real world. The first session will close Nandita Kalidos, who will talk about a very important topic nowadays, debunking vaccine hesitancy. After a 10 minute break, we will continue with presentation by Begi Karcivadze, who is analyst of memory and disinformation studies at Institute for Development of Freedom of Information. And she will speak about the objectives of the COVID-19 disinformation and strategies for countering it. Matt Verick, who is co-founder and president at the Disinformation Project, will speak about how the disinformation crisis requires culture change. And Oikum Humakeskin from Tate will share her experience in relation to COVID-19 infodemic. Stay with us until the end of the webinar as we will have a discussion with all those speakers and they will be able to answer your questions. When it comes to housekeeping rules, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. The speaker will answer them after the presentation. To make it even more interactive, you can also raise your hand and we will allow you to speak. Use the chat only for comments, please. If you are watching us on YouTube, you can write your question to the chat there. If you want to speak about us on the social media, please do not forget to use the hashtag ubicwebinars. So now we can actually stop uh, this our survey and we can share the results. So the first question was, how many times faster than truthful news does fake news spread on Twitter? According to a study by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States in 2018. So the options were six times, five times, seven or eight. And the correct answer is six times. So 43% majority of you uh, were wrong. You thought that it's eight times. And then the second question was, uh, which one of the following statement is true? We had 10 statements and um, I won't read all of them, but uh, actually majority of you thought that none of those statements are true, but you are wrong because there is one a truth statement and it's that uh, the Canary Islands are named after dogs, not birds. So you have to improve uh, how to spot the, the fake news and, and the fake statements. Thank you very much for uh, joining this poll. So now without further ado, uh, we will turn the time over to our first presenter, Anneli Ahonen, who is currently head of East Stratcom Task Force a team in the European External Action Service that addresses Russia's disinformation through proactive communication and media support in the Eastern Partnership countries and exposes disinformation on eu versus disinfo.eu. 
Before joining the East Stratcom Task Force in 2017, Ahonen was working as a foreign reporter in St. Petersburg for eight years and covered, among other topics, uh, St. Petersburg troll factories activities at its early stages. Thank you, Anneli, for being with us today, and we are looking forward to your presentation now. Thank you very much, uh, Vladka. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, let me just share with you now my presentation, uh, and then we can start. And I can see from the um, poll results uh, that I am talking to a very skeptical audience who already knows that this information uh, spreads uh, fastly uh, around the world, uh, but uh, not as fast as as um, as you may be assessed. Uh, so maybe this is like a, a positive uh, light in the uh, in this this discussion. Uh, but what I'm planning to do today is to briefly go through um, like a bit of a timeline uh, of how. Uh, especially uh, foreign states have been exploiting uh, the pandemic uh, to achieve their own political goals um, uh, and using disinformation as a, as a tool in this. Uh, and then talk about the EU's uh, response and, and what the EU is doing uh, to address disinformation. So as uh, Vladka already told you, I come from the uh, team called East Stratcom Task Force. Um, and it's a, a special team uh, at the External Action Service in Brussels uh, that was set up in 2015 to address especially uh, Russia's disinformation. And this, um, the mandate comes from the European Council, so all the EU member states agreed that the EU should uh, strengthen this kind of um, work. Um, and since then, we have been approaching um, uh, the question to, through three different work strands. So first is that we work in the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, uh, Georgia, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and improve EU's own communication uh, in there. Um, we work to uh, strengthen independent media uh, in that region as a crucial part of, of the work. Uh, and then as a third part, uh, we expose and, and publicly analyze, explain the trends um, and also empower uh, uh, people how, like, how to check the facts uh, themselves. And this we do through the EU versus disinfo. Uh, campaign, uh, which where we have a website, um, Twitter, Facebook, uh, you can follow us there, subscribe to our weekly newsletter where you can see all the, uh, the weekly trends, what is happening in the, in the world of uh, pro-Kremlin disinformation. Um, now then, uh, EU's uh, action plan against disinformation have brought this uh, work into a, the wider framework, uh, what the EU is doing. Um, and, and there we have uh, uh, four different key uh, pillars is to work with the social media platforms, uh, stronger cooperation together with the member states, EU institutions, uh, there is a rapid alert system to share information between the member states, uh, raise awareness about disinformation and, and put more resources be behind uh, detection and, and anal uh, analytical capability. Um, and here uh, was the moment when all the EU institutions started working together uh, to address the, the issue more widely. Uh, and now the most recent development uh, also during the pandemic has been uh, uh, the European Democracy Action Plan, uh, which takes forward, uh, for example, the definitions uh, behind disinformation. So disinformation as understood um, in the EU is uh, uh, verifiably false, intentionally spread uh, information, uh, which is uh, meant to cause public harm. And in the European Democracy Action Plan, this is taken for, uh, further, dividing it, uh, also misinformation, disinformation, uh, influence operations and, and foreign interference, um, to make also sure that the responses are uh, are, are better targeted, uh, and it takes forward ideas of um, um, of imposing the cost also to uh, to the disinformers. So this is like ongoing work. What is what is happening right now? 
so now, why why am I as as the uh, as the head of East Stratcom, uh, a team that addresses Russia's disinformation, speaking to you today um, in in the seminar about uh, COVID nineteen? Um, so what what happened uh, in the very beginning already of the uh, of the pandemic or any kind of this kind of crisis like global health crisis um, that creates a lot of uh, points of ex exploitation uh, to those who uh, who use routinely disinformation uh, is that they of course jump into into this crisis and this is exactly what happened. Uh, with pro Kremlin uh, uh, disinformation outlets, with the with the uh, with the ecosystem in in the very beginning of the of the uh, pandemic, um, and what we uh, can constantly see is that these efforts have not uh, stopped. Uh, the focus has has moved um, like beyond the focus of the conspiracy theories, uh, more targeted into the, into vaccinations and a, a little bit more about that, uh, very soon. Uh, and what, what is also remarkable is that, uh, COVID-19 brought up, uh, China strongly as, a, as an emerging actor that is engaging in, in very similar disinformation campaigns. Uh, as Russia uh, has been doing uh, for years and years. Um, now, if we go through uh, just like, like the timeline a bit, what, what has been the development, uh, here you can see a slide of the, like, the very early uh, first messages that we spotted um, on pro Kremlin uh, uh, outlets uh, about COVID-19. So this was late uh, January uh, in 2020. Um, and and this was like the early stages um, of the pandemic uh, when it hadn't really hit very hard yet Europe, uh, but the disinformation outlets were already um, uh, like starting uh, to to spread those messages, and they started with the message that it's uh, an artificial man-made uh, virus which has been created in. Western or NATO or US uh, biological weapon laboratories, which is a very early uh, or like very old um, disinformation trope uh, used by, um, uh, especially by, by Russian actors uh, for a very long time, for example, in the, in the Eastern partnership countries, especially. So in a way, what has happened is that there is an existing disinformation ecosystem where these messages then then can be easily picked up uh, and exploited further when there is a, like public interest and audience uh, for this type of of action. Uh, then the focus uh, later on uh, last year um, went more to the um, to the conspiracy theory side. So already the the, the ideas of forced vac uh, vaccination that there will be uh, uh, nanochips injected to people, uh, uh, targeting Bill Gates uh, strongly. All of this started very early already uh, last year. And um, all of these, these messages that I am uh, showing you today have been covered uh, on EU versus Disinfo and, and in the publicly available uh, database that now consists of, of 10,000 Kremlin disinformation messages. So that's also a valuable source if um, if you, uh, for example, want to, I don't know, want to de develop your own data tool, how to detect better uh, disinformation. So that can be used and we are ready to share that. Um, this uh, slide is about the, the impacts of disinformation, which is of course a very difficult uh, question, but I think what was important for the, also from EU institutions perspective, and from many governments' uh, perspective, was that something that the experts had been telling for, for a very long time about the harms and, and real seriousness of disinformation, all of a sudden became very clear with the COVID-19 um, uh, and, the, and the, the real effect uh, on people's health uh, is, is so concretely out there uh, and that it has to be, be tackled. Uh, so this is from a, a study by Abbas, which is actively working to counter disinformation. 
um, from last year, and it's about how um, how despite the, uh, like the promises of social media platforms, uh, a lot of disinforming, misinforming uh, coronavirus messages remained online uh, on social media. Um, and what is also maybe um, interesting from for for this kind of um, international audience that we have today. Uh, is that uh, it was very clear that many of the promises that the platforms have made, uh, like the main focus has been in, in English language. Uh, and then many smaller European languages or other languages are, are left like beyond that, beyond that scope of, of efficient uh, measures. Uh, and now we are uh, at the point um, currently where uh, the, the focus of, uh, of especially foreign actors spreading disinformation um, has been uh, shifted to, to the vaccines, which is um, also very prominently, um, or, you know, in the area <clears throat> or, or like on the uh, very legitimate um, public like debate and a topic and, and a concern for, for many people. Um, but from uh, like disinformation and how foreign uh, actors are exploiting disinformation, uh, it's been very clear that it's uh, like these contradicting messages are, are spread at the same time. So both uh, like clearly anti-vax uh, or clearly conspiracy, theory-based uh, uh, messages, uh, and in Russia's case, then at the same time, uh, like very traditional propaganda campaign to, to boost uh, its own, own vaccine. Um, so th this is where the, the main focus is now is, and, and probably will, will stay for, uh, for in, the, in, the, like, in the near future as well. Now, what, what our team uh, has been doing to, to address uh, especially Russia's disinformation, uh, this is like the, the, um, the overall advice of, of what to do uh, to build up a comprehensive response. Uh, so, of course, you need at the same time in place like the, the wider institutional policy framework um, and build uh, the capacity in there. Uh, but then at the same time, you need uh, an effective communication to, uh, to be able to address it. Uh, and this is uh, what, what we have been uh, working on. So both on through E versus Disinfo um, campaign, advising very clearly to, um, to audiences of what can you do, like very concretely also promoting civil society uh, work and, and media journalist work. Um, you know, you have to, th this type of um, advice. We have been working together with the, uh, with the Young Amb Ambassadors Network in the Eastern Partnership countries, uh, giving trainings uh, and as well um, uh, having, um, joint campaigns uh, with them to raise awareness uh, and then in the in the like longer run uh, like building this better improved communication in the um, EU's neighborhood uh, here we have been putting a lot of effort uh, behind uh, EU's uh, building improved the use communication, right? So it has to be uh, like all the inter institutions, all the delegations working together, uh, having a, a streamlined messages that will actually go to the audience uh, in the needed language uh, in a way that people understand them. And this way also uh, make sure um, that uh, not only the disinformation, uh, for example, about the EU, but also targeting wider issues. Um, is, is prevalent in there. Uh, and this is an example of the results of the work together with, the, uh, with all the EU institutions um, that uh, in, the, in the Eastern Partnership countries, gradually EU's uh, uh, like support to the EU as an in, uh, international institution has been growing. Um, and then we have also during the um, 
uh, during the pandemic, uh, been focusing more on international cooperation uh, and, for example, uh, cooperation with NATO. Uh, so we did uh, online seminars uh, in Georgia to build uh, resilience against disinformation um, together jointly. Uh, and here are some of the some of the uh, products that we have um, uh, available. Uh, so we have been publishing wider COVID-19 disinformation special reports that cover also a wider range of actors um, than Russia. So they have been including China uh, and other regions as well. Uh, so this has been ongoing uh, coverage of, of making clear that uh, uh, like what is happening in the, at the uh, information space. Uh, and we continue to follow uh, and expose uh, disinformation that is that is related to uh, COVID-19 through you versus uh, disinfo. So here are our uh, contacts. Uh, and let me now stop here and I am happy to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Anneli, for a very um, informative and interesting presentation. So we have now space for questions from the audience. Uh, and in the meantime, until we will have uh, some questions, I would like to also ask you, um, for example, how do you measure the impact of your work? Yes, so we uh, that is like one of the the crucial parts of uh, uh, of how to of course like how to build the communication capaci capacity how to uh, how to improve your work. So uh, when it comes to proactive communication and strategic communication in these and partnership countries, uh, the, every campaign is uh, evaluated and measured, and then we get back to the results and and uh, based on that uh, can work further. Uh, together with the, with the, all the other uh, EU institutions. Uh, when it comes to our own uh, campaigns, uh, here, of course, our target audience uh, is quite wide, but it's still more focused on uh, government officials, um, uh, journalists, especially uh, disinformation experts, which is a widening uh, audience right now, uh, but to general audience. Um, as well, and here we uh, try to make as topical and relevant uh, content as possible, so that it would reach out to the to the wider uh, audiences. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. And what do you think? How will uh, the disinformation scene uh, develop from this moment? Also, I know that you are focused on uh, the Kremlin and the Russian disinformation scene. So perhaps uh, you can tell us more about the current situation, as we know also that there are huge opposite uh, protests and with Alexei Navalny uh, in prison. So perhaps you can tell us how it will reflect on the disinformation scene. Well, I mean, like the the, the overview in a way is that uh, Russia has been using similar tactics now, uh, well, like in the current era, at least for uh, over 10 years, uh, and not much has been changing in there. So uh, what have we have seen around the Belarus protests, um, around Navalny poisoning, uh, and now uh, also the, the protest to, to support Navalny um, is very like old, fashioned, visible Kremlin tactics, how you discredit your opponent, how you discredit the, uh, the protests, so the, you belittle and diminish them, uh, the claims that they, uh, they originate in the West or the Western secret services are somehow there. Meddling all of this is like very, um, you know, old fashioned and, and, and visible part of the uh, pro Kremlin disinformation campaign. But what has been interesting is, uh, is probably that we have also developed ways to, to measure the, the impact of these campaigns. Uh, and what was quite interesting finding, I, I think, on um, disinformation related to Navalny uh, was that in Germany it had a it had quite big reach. Uh, so they, uh, for example, Russia Today was uh, um, like the second one uh, on like top five list 
uh, of most shared social media content uh, in the German uh, information space. Uh, so it managed to get really penetrate the, the audiences uh, while the situation in, in the uh, English language uh, social media sphere was much you know, better in the way that uh, the pro-Kremlin disinformation sources were not uh, topping social media engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question from, uh, from Nandita. Um, is the information dissemination only in English or other vernacular languages as well? She's asking, and also what has been your biggest challenge in information dissemination? Um, uh, on EU versus disinfo, so we, uh, we translate everything uh, into Russian. So we have everything in English and in Russian. Uh, and during the, the pandemic, uh, we managed to launch also uh, German, French, uh, Spanish and Italian. Uh, versions of the website. So there we can't, uh, we don't have the resources to translate everything, but we translate um, the most important articles. So once a week we have a, we have an article in these languages as well. Mm -hmm. And what was the, the biggest challenge in uh, the information dissemination? In the information dissemination, well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's the same uh, issue for, for many organizations for any um, uh, civil society organization or a government who is working on this issue, which is that you would really need to get out from your comfort uh, zone and bubble to, to the wider audiences. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think this is, this is clearly, uh, uh, clearly the, <laughs> the, the biggest challenge. Uh, but on the other hand, during the pandemic, what was also interesting is that uh, there was such a huge increase for like and demand for for fact-based information. So overall, like the, the people's desire to learn more and understand what is happening uh, increased. Um, and I think I think that many of the uh, of the people who are working in the field also felt that there is a growing interest um, in the in this work. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you think should uh, the governments be doing and uh, also what is the role of uh, civil society and media? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I really don't have any, any new, <laughs> new answers to this, uh, but clearly there should also be more support for the civil society and media who are working on this because I, I think it's very clear for everyone uh, that it shouldn't be only governments who are dealing with this. Uh, but then when it comes to, uh, to like foreign interference, to like wide disinformation campaigns that go across the countries and are, are trying to divide the countries apart from each other, uh, I think in this case, it's very also clear that there is a role for the government that has to be taken. Uh, and this can't be only outsourced for, for the civil society, because that would also not be... Uh, not be fair, but but also like to, to hand out more support to the civil society and media would be uh, would be very much needed. Thank you. There is another question, uh, Anneli. What do you think about azithromycin combined with hydroxychloroquine and or Tamiflu? Do you think they are effective preventive methods? Oh, this is a very interesting question. I didn't even really, uh, really understand this. Are, are these some kind of like flu, flu uh, medicine? Yeah, somebody is asking if you if you have some, <laughs> some, uh, some. If you think they are effective, I don't know why somebody is asking this. But perhaps you don't, you don't, don't have, have any. The, clue. I don't have the answer. I, will, I have to go get back to that question later. Okay, so this is more <laughs> like a medicine question for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, I would like to also ask you why actually uh, did you decide to, to uh, go this way uh, and to, to make your career in this disinformation uh, area? Uh, why, why this is your work actually? Why are you doing this? Uh, well, I think I'm, I'm quite convinced uh, that um, there is a role for the EU uh, that has to also be strengthened uh, when it comes to... Uh, Foreign states disinformation campaigns like the one that is originating 
in Russia. So, of course, my background is in journalism um, and is, especially in Russia, where I have been living in eight years. Um, so, uh, like I have been interested in, in Russia for a very long time, but then I also could see uh, what kind of harm uh, state managed and like manipulated information space uh, can do in the end. Um, and and I I'm, <laughs> I am convinced uh, that the 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 EU's uh, resilience against this uh, was was need to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so if you have any other questions, please somebody from our participants. I can see that uh, Mrs. Shunman uh, is raising hand. I don't know if you want to say something or not. Um, so if you want, you have the space now but probably not anymore. Uh, so thank you very much, Anneli, for your presentation. Uh, so I hope that you will stay with us uh, during the, the discussion and then also the participants can ask you also some other questions. Thank you again. So now is the time uh, to introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker is uh, Mr. John Mitchell. Uh, who is a speaker, researcher, consultant, and coach. And he has experience as a senior business and IT leader in many varied geographic and commercial environments. John worked for 30 years in finance, energy, technology, and supply chain sectors, making decisions concerning business and technology investments, as well as many, many contracts. Most of these worked out, but some didn't. John knows that you should learn from all your decisions, whether they work out or not. John has an MBA from the University of Surrey, and I believe that we all want to improve our critical thinking. So we are happy that John is here with us today and he will uh, teach us something new. So thank you, John, and you can start with your presentation. I can't see myself, Ladka. Do I need to start it? Oh, there we yes, go. we can see now. Yes. Marvellous. OK, terrific. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Vladka. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about um, fake news and uh, disinformation and provide a couple of techniques on how you can spot it. Uh, but uh, it's not going to be a one way conversation. I'm going to uh, ask all you people out there in Internet land to help me a little bit. And I'm going to uh show you uh ask you uh, to investigate a couple of stories well three stories in, in fact and i will introduce the first one and then i'll talk to you a little bit more so if you're in the uh, zoom session you should be able uh, to see a link just appeared in the chat panel uh, that's a url pp1.jbitch.co.uk if you're on YouTube, I can't provide a link, but I can tell you the URL you need to go to. So if you could visit that URL on your laptop or your tablet or your phone or whatever you had, that would be uh, very helpful. Uh, once you get there, you should be able to see a screen that looks like this. Hang on just a second. Well, I share my uh, screen. Here we go. All right. This is, uh, a, you'll get redirected from pp1.jmich.co.uk to a, uh, a Google form. And on this Google form, there is a story here. This is a story taken from the Weekly World News in 1993. I think we have a couple of Americans in our participants, so they might be familiar uh, with this publication. It's not in print anymore, but it certainly was in 1993. And the headline is uh, Farmer Shoots 23 Pound Grasshopper with a little picture there offered as uh, proof. So if you can uh, go to your uh, the voting bit here down the bottom, and if you can tell me whether uh, that story is complete and utter lies by marking it with a one, or definitely not lies by marking it with a 10 or somewhere in between by marking it on any of the others, that'd be good. There'll be two more of these stories. They'll be in the same 
format. So uh, uh, it'd be good to practice with this one. So I will stop sharing now. Hopefully everybody's got there and I'll be able to show you the results in a minute. So uh, most of the time, uh, I, uh, I the reason I got into this subject is because I uh, run workshops on critical thinking, crit critical thinking workshops designed to help organizations and individuals improve their decision-making processes. And a very important part of decision-making is uh, making sure that you live in the real world. This is because decisions uh, will contain assumptions, and assumptions are generally as a result of some opinions you might have, and you will base those opinions on fact. So a good example of this would be, I'm gonna to go to dinner at this particular restaurant this evening because I assume that the food will be good. And you might have based that assumption on the fact that you've read the menu beforehand and there's a couple of dishes on the menu that you might like. Uh, you might say, I'm going to have the COVID-19 vaccine because I assume that the vaccine uh, will offer me protection against the coronavirus. And that's based on the fact that they've done lots of testing and it has protected people against the coronavirus. Now, if the facts underlying these assumptions are incorrect, wrong, or based on fake news, you can make some very bad decisions. You can end up going to uh, a restaurant and having a bad meal because the menu you looked at was five years out of date, or maybe you end up invading the Capitol building in the United States and serving a lengthy prison sentence because uh, you believed that the uh, election in the United States was as a result of electoral fraud, a piece of disinformation, and therefore you decided you needed to protest and rise up and reinstate the rightful president of the United States, uh, uh, Donald Trump. Probably not a great decision. Um, so let's have a little look at the results, shall we, of this poll. Let's see if we've got some coming in. Good, yeah, we've got a few people sending in results. So let me share that screen. Here we go. All right. So 72%, uh, so not an overwhelming majority, but quite a lot of you uh, have managed to mark this uh, story as being complete and utter lies, and you would indeed be correct. Uh, Weekly World News was a very famous tabloid newspaper in the States, the sister publication of National Inquir Inquirer. The big difference between the National Inquirer and Weekly World News is that the Weekly World News did even less fact checking than the National Enquirer uh, uh, did. And most of the stories that were printed in the Weekly World actually weren't uh, true. Uh, this picture actually dates back to the 1930s. So the, although this is a headline in a 1990s version of the paper, uh, the picture dates back to the 1930s and was a very ex early example of photoshopping using manual darkroom skills to stick two photographs together, one of a grasshopper and one of a uh, farmer. I've no doubt that we'll see this picture in the near future uh, featured in some other propaganda saying that uh, if you get a corona uh, virus vaccine uh, in your left arm, then soon you'll have a grasshopper growing out of it. So it's <laughs> not, uh, not unlikely that this will be used uh, again and again and again. Now, the real big giveaway here um, to this uh, story is the fact that it's only this photograph. And in fact, in the next week in the Weekly World News, they ran another story saying that the farmer had been found dead in his bed with uh, grasshopper bites in his neck. Uh, but they used exactly the same picture again. And this is uh, emphasizes the point that Annalie made in her presentation that you need to check the facts and in particular, you need to do something that uh, is stated as obtain independent confirmation of the facts. If there really was a three foot long, 24 pound grasshopper, then you can bet that there would be more than one photograph of it, probably photograph from different angles and uh, available in many different uh, publications. Now, this principle, obtain independent confirmation of facts, is pretty common used by many, many journalists. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, and there are many books that write about uh, conspiracy theories and talk about techniques to define 
conspiracy theories, but my particular favourite is this one by a guy called Carl Sagan. And I'll show you a slide so you get a little better picture of the reference here. There we go. And he wrote a book in the 1990s called The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark, from which this quote is taken. Now, uh, he was an astrophysicist, so a lot of his preoccupation was with space and uh, space journeys. He worked on the Voyager program. And so a lot of this book covers um, uh, popular myths to do with uh, aliens and UFOs, which were also especially popular at that time. At the time, alien induction stories were very, very common in the 1990s. But in this book, there's a chapter, chapter 12, called the Baloney Detection Toolkit. And if you do nothing else, I would really, really recommend that you uh, read this one chapter of Carl Sagan's uh, book. It's readily available online. There's lots of links off my website and you'll find it elsewhere. The Baloney Detection Toolkit from the Demon Haunted World. And in the uh, Baloney Detection Toolkit, Carl Sagan lists nine things that you should do uh, if you want to prove or uh, argue for your hypothesis or proposal, and a list of 20 things that you shouldn't do. And that if you hear other people using these 20 techniques, these methods of argument, then maybe you should start to smell the baloney. Number one on his list of the things that you should do is obtain independent confirmation of the facts. And like I said, obtaining independent confirmation of the facts, it would have been very difficult to obtain independent confirmation that that grasshopper was really thief at one. So we're going to go to our second um, poll now. So let me just share the screen and I'll put the... Uh, put the link up as well. This is a little bit more recent, taken from a tweet made at the beginning of last year, or, or actually April of last year, so after coronavirus had started. So I'll put the link in the chat. There we go. Uh, share my screen. There we go. That's pp2.jmich.co.uk. And for those of you on YouTube, hopefully you can see that that is the URL you have to go to. So I'll give you five minutes or so to uh, fill in that uh, vote and let me know how you think. Let me read out the tweet for those of you who might find that a little bit hard to read on your screen. So this is a, a, a prominent um, tweeter. He's got 3,000 followers. I don't know much about him. Uh, perhaps Annalie has investigated him. I'd be interested to know if she has. But uh, anyway, he, he has tweeted, coronavirus and 5G symbolism on the UK £20 note as genocidal Freemason, Kabbalist and Jesuit controllers mark, mark their soon-to-be-murderous victory over humanity. Billions are about to be culled. So quite a tweet there. And what he's actually referring to is... Um, early last year, the Bank of England in the UK introduced a new uh, £20 note. This is it. Now, like most countries, the UK prints pictures of famous leaders. We've got the Queen, she's got a famous leader, uh, and famous citizens on their banknotes. This is an uh, artist called J.M. Turner. What Adriano Mazzola is referring to, he's referring to this little mark up here in the top uh, left-hand corner, and he's saying, look, look, the, the Kabbalist, Freemason and Jesuit controllers of the earth uh, have um, are obviously controlling the Bank of England. And uh, they printed the coronavirus symbol on the uh, on the banknote itself here on this 20 pound uh, banknote. So, uh, you know, that goes to show that, that just proves to us uh, that. Uh, this uh, liberal uh, elite are controlling us all and are going to be killing billions of us very soon to further their own evil end. So I'll stop sharing that for the moment. I will let people finish in their voting. And while I'm talking about that, I will just talk about another thing that 
Carl Sagan mentions in his book. So um, we haven't got time today to go through all of the nine things you should do and the 20 things you shouldn't do, but I picked on two. One, which I think is the most important, obtain independent confirmation of the facts. Any good journalist will tell you that. And then I'm going to talk about one of the things you shouldn't do, uh, which is a particular argument technique that is uh, very uh, beloved of conspiracy theorists in, in particular. And it's something that uh, Carl Sagan calls appeal to ignorance or ignorance as proof. And the way this argument works is you say, because you can't prove to me that this thing isn't happening, therefore this thing is happening. Um, and uh, an example I can give you of that is uh, you can't prove to me that I haven't got a magical invisible fairy sat on my lap right now in front of me because it's invisible and, and you can't see it. But I'm telling you uh, it's there and uh, you must believe me uh, because you can't prove that it isn't there, therefore it is there. Now, that doesn't feel like a very good argument, but it is an argument that's used over and over again in conspiracy theories, because what conspiracy theorists say is this is secret. They say it's a secret liberal elite that's controlling us all. It's a secret that Bill Gates is putting nano chips into the uh, virus. And it's secret that the Illuminati have infiltrated the Bank of England. So let's have a little look at this result of this poll. Let me just share the screen. Okay, okay, we've still got one resolutely sticking with uh, Masola here. As uh, Annalie said, uh, uh, we seem to have quite a sceptical audience here today. Uh, I'm sure that's true. And, and actually, one of the problems that uh, I come across, especially when I speak to uh, younger people about critical thinking and, and fake news, is that one of the results of having so much misinformation in the world is that people become very jaded and they tend to disbelieve anything. And I think we saw an example of that in the very first poll that um, Vladka stuck up today in that there was a true fact in there that most people thought was uh, uh, false. Um, and the advice I would offer is that it's important to be uh, sceptical rather than cynical. Uh, if you don't know, you don't know. And doing the things that Sagan says uh, about obtaining independent confirmation of facts, investigating the stories. You need to keep an open mind until you've done that. You should start to smell the baloney if you see people deploying the appeal to ignorance argument. Uh, but it doesn't mean it isn't true. It doesn't mean there isn't a conspiracy. Uh, but it's probably worth checking it out before you start retweeting your conspiracy theories far and wide. In actual fact, most conspiracies, real conspiracies that have happened, tend to take the form of cover-ups of mistakes or bad things that have happened in the past, rather than covering up evil schemes to plot about the future. And that's worthwhile remembering when somebody is telling you that billions are about to be culled. So, uh, oh, one final thing. You're probably wondering what this little coronavirus symbol on the £20 note uh, is. Well, it's pretty straightforward, really. So. J.M. Turner was a famous artist, British artist in the Victorian era, painted many, many pictures and collected art of his own. When he died, he left his art to the uh, Tate Gallery. Uh, that's now called the Tate Britain Gallery that's in Pimlico, Victoria area of London. It's quite a grand old Victorian style building. And at one end of it is a room or a, a large staircase called the Rotunda. It's a spiral staircase. And this is a top down representation of the spiral staircase at the at the Tate Britain, at the Tate Britain uh, Museum. It's not a coronavirus uh, at all. Nevertheless, coronavirus sat on top of a 5G mask. Nice story, Adriano. Let's move on to our next and final poll. So I'll just stop sharing for a moment. OK.
put the link in the chat. Same format, PP3. No, not that one. Right, no. Okay, this third story is about uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, hopefully you can all see that for those of you who are on YouTube. Here is the website you need to go to, pp3.jmitch.co.uk. So on the 19th of March 2020, uh, four days before the UK went into its first lockdown, uh, with uh, incidents of COVID-19 sharply spiking and deaths starting to increase in the UK, uh, Boris Johnson said at a press conference, I think, looking at it all, that we can turn the tide within the next 12 weeks. And I'm absolutely confident that we can send coronavirus packing in this country. So Boris said he thought we could get the better of COVID-19 within 12 weeks of the 19th of March 2020. So I would like you to tell me whether that is complete and utter lies, one or definitely not lies, 10. Please, all right, if you can go to that. While, I'm, while we're waiting for people to answer that poll, I'll talk about another um, issue that affects us when we're critically evaluating new information. In particular, I want to talk about the role of experts. This is not something that's in Carl Sagan's book, but rather comes from a, a, a psychologist and pundit, a, a researcher, a chap called Philip Tetlock, who produced a book called Political Judgment, How Good Is It? How Can We Know? in 2005. Now, in the Brexit campaign in the UK in 2015-2016, one of uh, now Boris Johnson's ministers and a, an ardent supporter of his in the Brexit campaign, a chap called Michael Gove, said, well, I think we've all had enough of experts. There's a famous quote that was used a lot uh, in the papers. We seem to warm to them again recently in the in the um, COVID-19 virus, and it's noticeable that when Boris Johnson does his press conference, he's always flanked by two experts, normally the chief medical officer uh, uh, of the UK. But what Philip Tetlock tells us in his book about experts is we need to be a little bit careful when it comes to predicting the future. So um, he used to work for uh, a company that did a lot of research, and um, it projected trends and fed experts with information to allow them to go uh, and uh, be interviewed by the press and, and make predictions about things like GDP growth, economic growth, those kind of economic indicators. And he noticed that, um, that actually most experts were very unsuccessful at this. So he conducted a survey running over five years, so he had a chance to see how accurate people really were where he created a control group, of people who weren't experts at all, uh, people who were experts, and then uh, a set of straight lines where he just extrapolated what had happened over the previous five years uh, to the next five years for all sorts of uh, economic indicators. And what he found was that actually the straight lines, although not being a desperately reliable indicator of the future, were more reliable than both the experts and the non-experts. He found that the non-experts were a little bit better at predicting the future than the non-experts, but actually the difference wasn't particularly significant. So experts weren't, weren't much better than non-experts at predicting the future. But where they were really significantly better was he also asked both the experts and the non-experts to talk about the confidence they had in their predictions. He asked them to put a percentage figure on how confident they were on whether that prediction would come true or not. So if they were completely certain, they put a figure of 100% against it. And what he found was that uh, actually uh, experts were significantly less confident about their predictions than people who had no expertise. In other words, the less expertise you have 
the more confident you become about your inaccurate prediction. So let's have a quick look at the results of this survey. Yeah. Right, we have a much uh, greater spread here, as you would say. And actually, the majority of people are saying that it is definitely not a lie. And I would like to tell those people, well done, you are correct. Because what Boris has done there is he's not told a lie because at the time he makes that statement, he doesn't know what the future is going to be. And that outcome is one of many possible outcomes that could have happened at that stage. What it actually is, is a very, very inaccurate prediction. Now, if you look at the footage of this press conference, you can see the two experts next to him, Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance, the two most senior medical officials in the country. They give a little glance across to Boris to go, are you sure you want to say that? Because they know that that prediction hasn't got a very high probability associated with it. They know that that's quite likely to be a very inaccurate prediction, and their level of confidence is significantly lower than his. And indeed, that turned out to be. Uh, we're now in our third lockdown in the country, and I believe our death rate is one of the highest uh, in the world. Good news is the vaccine is coming, and hopefully we can see a way through this crisis. But it's very noticeable that uh, Boris has not uh, repeated any of those uh, inaccurate predictions uh, going forward. I think it's useful to bear that in mind because um, we can be quite hard on people when they make inaccurate predictions, but actually none of us are very good uh, uh, at making them. But if we want to make the best decisions we can to help us plot our way through the future the best way we can, we definitely need to live in the real world. And I'm hoping that you are using the techniques that's in Carl Sagan's book and proposed by uh, Annalee and I'm sure the others on this call, we can hope to do that. Uh, so uh, my name's John Mitchell. Uh, you can find out more about me at criticalthinking.co.uk. Uh, I've got an online um, activity where you can practice these kind of skills at fakesnews.jmitch.co.uk and I hope that's been helpful to you. Vladka, back to you. Thank you very much, John. Thank you for a great presentation. So now we have the space for questions from the audience and we have already a few questions. So Matthew is asking, um, there is an assumption that only the least educated among us are vulnerable to widely false stories or theories. But we are finding in the US that it's not true. Many are quite well educated. And I can also say that we can see it in the, the, US, uh, the European Union as well. Uh, can you speak to this? What do you think about it? What's going on? Well, I think this problem of um, cynicism as opposed to skepticism is a very real issue. And I'm sure Annalie will probably talk about this uh, when we come to the Q&As at the end is that when Russia propose, you know, like spreads this disinformation, it's not necessarily expecting that the people who receive it are going to believe that information. But what they're hoping to do is shed enough doubt that people will stop believing in anything. And I think this is a big uh, part of the reason for vaccine scepticism. Because people know that they've been lied to in many, many instances, they stop believing anything. So I, I think it's very, very important that we be sceptical rather than cynical. And we use these techniques to make sure that we keep an open mind on new information and then go and check it out. It's no good keeping an open mind and then just believing it. You've got to keep an open mind and then do the research. And the number one thing you should do is obtain independent confirmation of the facts. So I think that's what's happening in the US with these kind of quite educated people is they're becoming very uh, disenchanted with all of their information sources because they, they know that there's a lot of lies in it. And then they end up retreating to a bubble where they feel safe, a social media bubble where they feel safe. And once you're in that place where you're only listening to the same types of voices, if they're false voices, then you're in real trouble and you'll end up invading the Capitol building. Hmm. There is a comment actually from Roberto to this. Uh, he's saying that formal education or expertise in a particular field does not guarantee general knowledge or media literacy and ability, ability to think critically. Thank you for a comment, Roberto. 
Yeah, yes, I, I think uh, that's true because we 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 tend, at least in in UK universities and, and UK educational establishments, and I think this is true in a lot of Western education establishments, we focus on the subjects themselves rather than on how to appreciate new information. So this type of uh, technique uh, that Carl Sagan proposes, Anneli is talking about these journalistic techniques. You don't tend to find them um, in common places all across the educational spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, there is Igor, our participant, who would like to say something. So please, Igor, you can you can uh, say something now. Uh, yes, I would uh, like to uh, uh, to say what what if uh, the it is fake that the news is fake. In other ways, it is true, but everybody thinks it's uh, not uh, true, which uh, I think we had uh, a lot of cases uh, in the corona crisis. And uh, I think uh, the result of this is that uh, 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 there are significant researches that uh, are showing that uh, Russia is buying uh, the, the media. In more particular, each time there are elections in some uh, European country, um, uh, uh, political parties go to the mo parties go to the moguls in Russia, and they will give them a grant for the elections, for campaign, for everything. But in exchange, they are asking for uh, their installments in the decision-making bodies in the countries around uh, Europe, and that's how this uh, one uh, French journalist she find out that in uh, in the city council of Madrid. Uh, 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 10 uh, from 16 members of the city council are Russian installment. And actually she find out that in the, in the past um, 20 years with these installments, Russia is controlling the budget of the public sector of uh, the European Union, uh, almost a half of the public money. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, a really small uh, attention was paid on uh, this uh, fact. And uh, the other fact is that uh, uh, all of the journalists that were lately killed uh, in uh, European Union were researching the misuse of the public money in uh, uh, European Union. So I think that this uh, public money is, uh, is used for buying media and I wrote here uh, one of uh, the latest fact with the Telegram app, which we are attacked, North Macedonia is attacked with this uh, app, but no media published that uh, this app is uh, Russian and uh, because all media in North Macedonia is bought from Gamma, this is a gas company from Russia mm -hmm. and uh, how do you comment this and how we can fight this because uh, this is big also in Western European countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is a question for John, perhaps also for Anneli, or we will have also a question, uh, then later presentation by Maggie uh, Karcivadze, but perhaps you can, you can say your opinion as well, John, if you want. Okay, so I, I agree. I think it would probably be better uh, deferred to uh, the end. I don't know the provenance of uh, the stuff that Igor uh, was saying. Uh, that's some, not something I've particularly investigated. What I would say is that the EU are funding Annalise organization of, of Stratcom East, which is specifically designed to combat Russian disinformation. So the good news is that Russia isn't controlling all of the EU's uh, uh, budgets. That's clearly, that's clearly true. Uh, and I think in terms of what your average person on the street can do, they can do the research. They can deploy the uh, techniques that Sagan says and, you know, if you can't find that uh, independent confirmation of the facts, then it's not a fact. I mean, the Sputnik vaccine, which Russia had, it's a good vaccine, right? And one of the reasons you know it's a good vaccine is because not only are the Russians reporting that, it's been reported that way in uh, the Western world as well. And if it was a bad vaccine, you can bet the Western press would report it as a bad vaccine because it's not in their interest uh, uh, to do so otherwise. So that's a good example of where you find independent sources and you triangulate and you find out what the fact is. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. We will also uh, discuss this with Maggie and Anneli later on. Uh, there are other questions for you, John, um, from Adam. When you see outliers like this, how can you tell the difference between those who believe in the conspiracy and those just trolling and perpetuating the theory for lulls? You said uh, just propagating the theory for lulls, was it? Yes, the, the trolling and the theory for lulls. <laughs> So, so the weekly the Weekly World News um, went out of publication in uh, 2006, 2007, something like that. Uh, I'm sure our American panelists will be able to, talk, to tell, tell us more about that in the Q&A if you would, want to. These days, it's available. You can go to the Weekly World News online. And I would say these days, it's actually largely a satirical publication. It's... Uh, it's produced for comedy value. It's noticeable if you go to the Weekly World News website these days, it doesn't have a lot of coronavirus stuff on it. And I think that's because it's not funny for most of us at the moment. It's too serious a situation. There's an old adage that says that comedy is tragedy plus time. Well, we've got the tragedy, but we haven't got the time yet. And that's why I think there's not, not so many jokes or satirical information about it. The facts are still... Uh, uh, being discovered. I think all we can do is keep on um, applying the good message. This is why I do what I do, is because I, I, I want to convince people to go and do the research. And if they do the research, they will eventually find the truth. Okay, and Richard is asking, uh, when we live in a world where folk still believe the world is flat, men never walked on the moon, and Elvis is working in a supermarket in Walton on the Nave, should we just let folks get on with it? Of course, this doesn't apply to such things as Holocaust, denial, etc. Doesn't engaging uh, with the disinformation conspiracy theory brigade give them airtime and exposure? What do you think? Well, I, I, I think there, there is a, I think in the disinformation community, and I think that again, there'll probably be a bit of discussion uh, about this later on. There's a, a debate about whether you should censor or not, okay? So my view, and, and, and that's about starving people uh, the oxygen of the airtime. In general, I'm against that. Unless it's directly harmful, I would say censoring is a, is a bad idea because I think the way you disempower a piece of false information most effectively is by proving it to be false, not by silencing the person who says it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one of the topics also we will discuss during the discussion. So stay with us until the end of the webinar. Uh, there is another question. Uh, the media outlets uh, tend uh, to censor generalize facts for ratings. What is being done to make this less impact impactful? Sensationalized for ratings. Facts for ratings. Yeah, so uh, and that's not new, right? I mean, you go back to the 1400s and earlier, uh, people with vested interests always sensationalize stories or take stories and blow them out. If you go to uh, uh, Catalonia in Spain, Barcelona, you'll find there's quite a relatively small area where the number of sightings of the Virgin Mary in a certain period was kind of huge. Right? Now, it seems unlikely that the Virgin Mary decided to appear at that particular place, at that particular period in history, repeatedly over and over and over again, and urged the people of those townships to pay their church taxes, which is normally what she did when she appeared to uh, uh, individuals at, at, at that time. So um, one of the things that Annalie said in her uh, presentation was check the source, right? If the source has a vested interest, then as Carl Sagan would say, you should start smell the baloney at that stage. It doesn't mean that what they're saying isn't true. It just means that they've got a reason to tell you something that isn't necessarily true. So that just makes the uh, research and the independent confirmation of the story even more important to execute. And, it, you know, we, we all like to mix with people who are like us. But when it comes to forming an opinion about something, that's not always the most healthy thing to do. We need to find people who aren't like us, because if you've got two people from opposite ends of the political spectrum telling you the same facts, you can probably be a lot more confident in that fact. Mm -hmm. And the last question for you is, uh, what is the difference between fake news and lying? There isn't any difference. <laughs> well, I would say, I, I, let me caveat that slightly. So 
Um, if you're on the receiving end of fake news or lying, you don't feel any different because the impact will be uh, the same on you. Uh, if it's a white lie, like uh, Elvis Presley seen in a supermarket, that doesn't really impact you, so you, you don't care. But if it's a more serious thing, like you shouldn't get this vaccine or this vaccine is going to kill you, then that has a big impact uh, on you. And it doesn't matter what the motivation is for the person telling you that uh, piece of misinformation. So uh, whether you're doing it for a joke or whether you're doing it uh, because you've got some evil uh, intent, um, you need to think about the impact that what you're doing is having, because I think that's more important than your motivation. Yes, and there is a question, the last last question from David related to this. What is the best technique uh, to convince uh, that someone is defending or spreading fake news? Like arguing with the, the COVID uh, negotiations? Or, or... I, and, I, I, and I get that. I, I, again, absolutely is that uh, independent sources is the number one thing you should do. There are other things you should do and you can invoke uh, uh, Carl Sagan's baloney detection toolkit Uh, you can, especially when people are making inaccurate predictions. Uh, and I think the best thing to do there is like call it for what it is. I think it's one of the reasons I constructed the polls the way I said, uh, I said, uh, complete and utter lies and definitely not lies were the two scales. But actually, you know, you might tend to think of that as being lies and truth. Well, between lies and truth, there's actually quite a lot of gray space, which is about opinion and theorizing and hypotheses and, and, and prediction. And we need to be aware of what those are, are because a lot of creativity is in, is in that space. And, you know, unless we allow people to dream about the future and make theories, then we won't advance ourselves. We won't solve some of the really horrible problems we, we have. We've never got a vaccine unless somebody had come up with a theory. It happens that, you know, the people who came up with those uh, vaccine theories, they were right. Okay, they turned out to be right. Their prediction turned out to be right. But there was no guarantee that that would, that that would happen. So I think it's important to call things what they are and call a prediction or an opinion, a prediction or opinion, not a fact or a lie. Okay, thank you very much, John, again, for your presentation. Uh, we thank will you. discuss more during the discussion at the end. And now it's time to introduce our next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Nandita Kalidos, and she will speak actually about a very important topic, uh, which is uh, the debunking vaccine hesitancy. Uh, Nandita is the Health Fellow Misinformation at Factly Media and Research in partnership with Facebook. She has started out her training in media and communications, but subsequently hopped on to policymaking and strategy, and now on to understanding and tackling misinformation. She has always wanted to craft a career that reflects her personality, and through to that, her interdisciplinary background has equipped her with the advantage of understanding both empirical and empathetic challenges of any given complex problem. Nandita likes to listen to Beatles, and we are very glad that you are here with us today, and you can start with your presentation. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can see, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Latka, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone from India. Thank you for joining us on the webinar today. And uh, I'll be taking you through a presentation on uh, debunking vaccine hesitancy in the next 20 minutes. So given the diversity of audience, uh, I thought we should first understand the basic terms, the difference between mis and disinformation that we have been extensively talking about. So the essential and predominant difference between mis and disinformation is the intent with which it is spread. Let me give you an example. Uh, if you are just scrolling through your social media or wherever you get your news from, you uh, find a very catchy headline and you think that's interesting and you forward it to your uh, friend, colleague or your family member. But turns out that misinformation, that is actually fake news and it's misinformation. So this tends to be qualified qualified as misinformation, whereas disinformation is the person who has actually posted the video to purposefully misle mislead and misguide you to believe that something that is not true, something that is not true. Like John was actually mentioning very interesting that uh, on the spectrum of truth to false, there's a lot of gray area. 
and that is where we fact checkers come into picture and we wanted to bucket this gray area and uh, that is how we ended up bucketing them into say false partially true partially false misleading because the information that you are reading is essentially not completely true or completely false let me give you an example for that uh, just for an instance uh, say a red car has met with an accident but what we read on social media is that a red car a car has met with an accident because it was red in color did the car meet with an accident yes but was it because of the red color not so true so this is exactly where bucketing the information becomes absolutely crucial and this is where we differentiate mis and disinformation and there are multiple reasons as to why mis and disinformation exists be it for poor journalism standards where they want to sensationalize news they want more ratings like one of the uh, audiences asked the question uh, they want to make fun of things online they want to uh, a lot of people have been making a lot of fake videos that go instantly viral because misinformation as stuck as such is pretty sticky when you read something off beat it tends to you tend to remember it for a longer time and that is how they have been able to make off a lot of money from say platforms like youtube social media like facebook twitter and uh, there's obviously the religious and the political propaganda that i will extensively talk about and some people are genuinely passionate to spread their ideology saying that what they believe is true or false and they also want others to believe what they actually stand for that is what passion stands for so why debunk why even debunk fake news uh, the slide that you're seeing right now uh, these headlines are a result of the 10 minute google search that i have done to put up all this together imagine this is what i could find in just 10 minutes of google search on page 1 of google this this is the real time repercussion and consequences of social uh, of fake news uh, that is misinformation and disinformation so it is obvious that fake news or uh, is no more restricted to the echo chambers or the walls of the social media but the internet has actually made the world a smaller place and there are real time consequences and uh, repercussions that people have been facing and uh, these fake news have actually turned out to be life threatening for people and it has turned out to be fatal for some uh, people as well so this is why debunking news uh, fake news especially health related fake fake news from what we have seen since last year is that uh, there's so much uncertainty going on there's so much nobody knows what's the cure or what is anything that is going on so a lot of fake news health related fake news has been traveling around has been circulating extensively but what we need to realize is that the fake news especially health related fake news induces a lot more psychological stress be it say anxiety or people have been depressed given the lockdowns or uh, there's there's only so much you could do and given the how the fake news was circulating it was in fact a very uh, crucial time for all of us and especially fact checkers to present the truth so when we say mis and disinformation when we say fake news uh it's not just about one thing that we are talking about fake news is like coronavirus it has really a lot of variants so we wanted to again bucket this misinformation and disinformation into various things we have got this framework from uh, one of the information disorders where we have tried to bring everything try to bucket fake news into these uh, seven things as such so when we say satire and parody say for instance that something on uh, has started off as a joke on uh, social media but it is actually fake news and people have actually taken it seriously it's someone has just started off as a joke to spread some fake news and uh, people have widely shared it that is uh, categorized as satire or parody misleading content is when uh, a person who has no qualification whatsoever claims to be uh, expert in the coronavirus Uh, understanding the pandemic and they give out a lot of misinformation claiming to be the expert in the domain imposter content is when we see a lot of whatsapp forwards where we get direct documents from who icmr in the indian context where the official authorities are giving out uh, saying that ginger is good for your health and it's going to cure corona virus we receive a lot of such things on uh, on social media under the name of who or official authorities fabricated content is when uh, people are actually fooled to believe that something is going to happen like say for instance vaccine tourism has started some people have actually been promised in india that they'll be taken to uk to get the vaccine and uh, they'd be uh, brought back 
uh, vaccinated and uh, obviously this entire package is charged a lot and people have actually signed up for it and this is all through the fabricated content that we have seen on social media false connection is when the headline is that okay this is xyz thing is the cure for coronavirus but if you actually read the article it has no connection whatsoever to the headline at all false context is when an expert actually said something say an expert said that xyz people might have adverse reactions because of the covid-19 vaccines and that is actually taken out of context and it is spread on social media that definitely million people will be affected by coronavirus so such things uh, are all, always taken out of context to sensationalize it to ensure that to make the uh, to create that panic in the echo chambers of the social media manipulated content is when a lot of old videos and images resurface uh, that these this is the current crisis of pandemic so this was about the types of fake news that it manifests itself in uh, now to understand and combat vaccine hesitancy let's first understand what vaccination and immunization even stand for because from what we have seen in our coverage is that the definitions also are uh, the words are uh, used interchangeably and uh, different people have different definitions for vaccines for some people it is just in injecting antigen in their body but for uh, a lot of people it means that they're injecting uh, say a foreign substance which is going to introduce chips into their body and uh, nanotechnology to collect their data and uh, big pharma companies are trying to make profits there are a lot of uh, conspiracy theories when it comes to vaccine so what is vaccine hesitancy now even before we go into understanding vaccine hesitancy let's understand that the human psychology as such is that when we don't understand something when uh, something is uncertain to us we tend to be hesitant towards it and vaccines are not uh, it's not just about vaccines say for instance uh, even as simple as uh, uh, wearing helmet for a two uh, two wheeler rider where uh, it is mandatory for them to wear a helmet because that is going to save your life in the event that you meet with an accident but people are still hesitant to do it because some people complain that they have dizziness or they can't breathe properly or they have white spots when they wear the helmet so even as something as small as wearing a helmet people are hesitant towards it and vaccine is something that is being injected to your body an external substance that is being injected to your body so this kind of hesitancy is understandable given that a lot of fake news is being circulated a lot of uncertainty is uh, around us uh but the thing is we are hesitant about wrong things people should uh, technically be worried hesitant about the news that they are consuming and not the vaccine per se but we'll come back to that so in the indian context it is important to understand vaccine hesitancy see we are a country of 1.3 billion people and vaccines play a very huge important role given the uh, given that we want to go back to our pre pandemic lives so there was an interesting local survey which said that 69% of the respondents are not willing to take the vaccine right now and uh, the graph that you see here from 61 to 59 to 69 this is also in tandem with the number of decreasing cases that is that india is witnessing right now till september there was a huge surge of cases the death rate was really high at one point of time we, we were almost second in the world and a lot of things were going wrong but suddenly since september a lot of cases have been going down and you can see that that is where from 59 to 69% from november onwards there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy because people have multiple reasons why they are hesitant towards vaccines be it for religious reasons or uh, by that i mean to say that certain minority communities in india believe that uh, the disease is an act of god so to go against that and get yourself vaccinated is actually equivalent to committing a sin it's a psychological aspect that they have in their mind that taking a vaccine is wrong and they it's going against their religion so the skepticism will range from religious reasons to uh, some people right now have are they believe that we have uh, reached herd immunity in india some people who have actually tested uh, positive for the corona virus they don't think they require it anymore and a lot of another interesting survey also says that 55% of the healthcare professionals are not hesitant to take vaccine understandably they have their own concerns with respect to their existing comorbidities or whatsoever reasons uh, but it is 
we will get into understanding the reasons as well and another vax, another uh, survey actually talks about how 53% of the country is actually hesitant towards taking vaccine you see this 10 plus 43 this is a crucial number and like i said these 43 is not they're skeptical they have their they're skeptical they're confused they're scared they have their own inhibitions they have their own concerns and uh, there comes the concept of gender bias Pe women are more hesitant than their uh, male counterparts and we'll understand all these reasons as to why this is happening and also there's age factor people have a range of issues with respect to understanding vaccines and why vaccine hesitancy it's because like i just said people have from say religious reasons to uh, saying that certain communities actually believe that the current government is actually trying to regulate their population through injecting vaccines, which in turn will cause sterility in them. And people are actually scared of widespread rumors that it, uh, men and women are going to become infertile. And uh, say one of the two vaccines that has been authorized in India, the Covaxin and the uh, Covishield vaccines, the phase three trials of Covaxin is not yet out. And that is why a lot of medical professionals are still skeptical whether to take the vaccine or not. And people are uh, hearing various uh, fake news as uh, like say that includes that the immunity after vaccination will last only for six months. So there is no point of taking vaccines and uh, they have to still continue to wear masks even after getting the vaccination done again questioning the efficacy of the vaccines and certain risk groups, the old age groups, the pregnant women, they have their own inhibitions, whether uh, how their comorbidities are going to be addressed and how if the coronavirus uh, vaccine, is it going to catalyze their problems further. And as such, when we, we, are, we are in the habit of scrolling and we are used to uh, having a very limited attention span. So when we read such uh, catchy headlines, uh, we tend to remember them more than what the content is actually about. And uh, like I mentioned, there are, there's a lot of religious and political polarization in India. By that, I mean to say religious people, uh, certain communities believe that uh, the ingredients of the vaccines, like say uh, using pork gelatin for the Islam community, they think that taking that vaccine is forbidden as per the religion. So they have those kind of religious inhibitions. Political polarization is like I've said, the current government is trying to regulate the population through these vaccines. And they have these bizarre claims which has no scientific evidence whatsoever. And a lot of people are actually making a lot of money off the internet through these fake uh, viral videos. And as such, uh, right now, Facebook, Twitter, all of them have, their, uh, have started to regulate the especially vaccine related information so that they guide people on the right way. And also like a lot of things are circulated on closed platforms where well, India is a diverse country with multiple languages. So you, it becomes all the more challenging to actually regulate all the uh, fake news that is coming in vernacular languages. So uh, on the other hand, people actually uh, debate that it is their freedom of choice whether they want to take the vaccine or not want to take, their vac take the vaccine. Of course, it is your individual choice. But uh, as of now, as of today that we are discussing this topic, uh, vaccines are the only solution for us to get back to our pre-pandemic lives. So given this is the only solution, uh, your freedom of choice, anybody's freedom of choice is not uh, unlimited. My freedom of choice will end the moment it infringes upon your privacy or your freedom of choice. Therefore, for the greater good of the world, it is important that we come together. And there's a behavioral concept called libertarian paternalism where we can nudge people to change their behavior towards getting the vaccination because it is for the overall good. And we have to meet at a common ground if we want to go back to our pre-pandemic lives. And yeah, like I mentioned, there are a lot of myths and misconceptions related to vaccines, especially there is a widespread of uh, myths and rumors going on about how vaccines are going to create a lot of problems for us. Uh, autism being the favorite uh, myth and misconception about almost any vaccine that has existed in the past, be it smallpox, polio, anything that we have taken in the past, it has always been related to autism. And uh, in, despite the fact that Multiple times, multiple uh, scientific evidence shows that they have disproved that there is no link between autism and vaccination. And like I said, certain communities believe that it is 
against their religion and that coronavirus is going to inject uh, uh, microchips in us and it's going to alter our uh, human DNA and in introduce like animal-like traits uh, in us and that it's going to make us zombies. There are like bizarre claims to like some understandable claims like say, uh, people are actually worried that it might cause uh, infertility in men and women. And there are also the bigger conspiracy theories where they're blaming uh, Bill Gates for the uh, for curating the entire uh, vaccination uh, project as such. And they're blaming the pharma companies who want to profit by making people sick. And also like uh, how the new vaccines itself are going to create another dangerous strain of coronavirus, so on and so forth. And we as fact checkers, it is extremely crucial that we uh, we tend to these matters. We actually give out the proof. We do the research. We put out the facts uh, for people to actually consume so that they're on the right track. Uh, this is a very interesting case study that comes from the southern state of Kerala in India. In the district of Malapuram, where there is a significant Muslim population, uh, there was a sudden surge of vaccine hesitancy, say about or two years, a couple of years ago, against the MMR vaccine. Uh, there were a lot of misinformation rumors that were being uh, circulated on WhatsApp, especially in the Malayalam language, where they said that it is against their religion. It is uh, the government is trying to regulate their uh, population and that they are going to be given harmful uh, vaccines, where which is going to uh, mess up their lives and children are going to become autistic, they will have learning disabilities, so on and so forth. And the picture that you're seeing is of Dr. Shimna Aziz. She is a government hospital doctor in Malapuram district in Kerala. So in one of her sessions, she has been the face of the campaign against anti-vaccination in Kerala. She, along with varied stakeholders, be it government, school teachers, parents, uh, frontline workers, police, you name it. All of them had to come together to design strategic communication for the way forward to combat vaccine hesitancy in Kerala. And uh, she, in one of her awareness sessions when she was talking to the parents, one of the parents actually challenged her to take the vaccine to prove the uh, safety and efficacy of the vaccine. And uh, in that spirit, she has actually ended up taking vaccine uh, because she understood that she had to come out of the shell of being a doctor and step into the shoes of the parents to understand their legitimate concerns because they're stemming from legit concerns for their own children. So instead of say imposing rules to take vaccines or whatever uh, imposed restrictions on people, it is so much more important to understand their concerns and fears and inhibitions as to why they do not want to take vaccine hesitancy. So this is where I come to my way forward. You see, this is the spectrum from where uh, people want to actively take vaccines to actively refusing vaccines. It is the middle population that we are concerned about because this population is confused, is worried, is uncertain, is not sure, is, uh, is absolutely clueless as to what these vaccines are going to do to them. So their skepticism has to be met with science. Give them the facts, give them what their inhibitions are. Is it uh, is it because of the religious issues? Is it because of their uh, uh, comorbidities that they're scared of? Or is it because they are afraid of 5G technology being induced into their bodies or say microchips is going about or they don't believe that the entire pandemic exists. It's actually, it's been created by the uh, big pharma companies. Whatever is the reasons, you need to pause, stop and spot. When I say that, it is extremely important that we as uh, educated population do not take any information that we are reading at face value. It is so much more important to pause and question what you're reading. You have to. Everyone should inculcate the habit of being inquisitive and questioning what you're reading so that you are not always taking false news as it comes and you are not just consuming the same uh, news that is doing uh, rounds on the echo chambers of the social media. So the next intervention that I'd like to suggest is the celebrity effect. By this, I mean to say that a lot of people are skepticism because they're really not sure as to what is going to happen. So how do you uh, combat the uncertainty? How do you, uh, what is the solution when someone is being unsure of something? 
you do it and show them that okay you know what this is okay to you it is okay for us to take the vaccine it is actually going to save lives and celebrity effect is when i'm suggesting that uh, the politicians the frontline workers uh, the doctors i mean to say that and uh, the bollywood and cricket especially in, in the indian context they actually uh, go and take the vaccine in order to instill and build confidence among people that it is safe because they will not take it if it is uh, not safe right so given that it is actually safe they have to encourage people like how they would uh, do it on a voting day in india on the election day that they encourage people to come out and vote similarly they should encourage people to come out and take this vaccine and uh, avoid coercion by that i mean to say that don't force things on people that is only going to make them take two steps backward instead listen to them listen to their concerns understand where they are coming from and engage with what their concerns are have they read it have they read something on uh, social media that is uh, giving them the uncertainty then there are fact checks to say that okay what you have read is wrong maybe there is the other side of it which is the truth and engage with them because if you are not going to engage with these people they are never going to learn because as we see we are only consuming information and it is so much more important that we have this discussion say at a family dinner or at your office or just like uh, just start a conversation on your uh, whatsapp where we are discussing as to what the issues are and if everybody is unsure you just have to go on google and try and put the keywords on google news and do your own fact check it is not and every country right now has their own fact checking organization so i'm sure that all the countries uh, including the social media facebook uh, twitter everybody is trying to uh, give you the correct information from the right authorities from the concerned and qualified professionals only so you are one step away from actually getting the correct news you just have to go on google news just that's the only extra added filter that you have to put go to google news and put out the keywords and you will get your answers and effective communication is uh, another thing obviously governments have a huge stake right now the role of media is extremely significant it's so much more important to how they cover vaccination is so much important because this is the time when you don't sensationalize the news as such you do uh, stable reporting it see if i have to give you an analogy let's talk about uh, how media covers airplanes when the flights land safely it is no news but when a flight crashes it is a disaster and it's a huge news and they are sensationalized vaccines coverage cannot be like that uh, do report adverse events i'm not saying that but put out positive stories to inbuilt and build confidence among the people they have to do a much more stable reporting do not go behind uh, the sensationalization and the ratings of the papers because this is not the time for that and vaccines are the only option that we have to save lives so that was from my end i hope uh, all of you thank you for staying with me through the presentation i hope all of you are staying safe wearing your masks and uh, participating social distancing that's from my end thank you thank you very much nandita for a very nice and informative presentation uh, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, for example, Andrew is asking, if we are so concerned about fake news, shouldn't we be concerned about a vaccine which took just seven months uh, to make? Yes, that's absolutely one of the biggest concerns that even healthcare professionals have. But the surveys, but what we need to understand is that uh, this pandemic has affected the entire world. So while I understand that the efficacy, like compared to other vaccines, which have taken five years time or a lot longer, the best minds of the world have come together to work on the vaccine to actually give us the best methods ever. And again, had it been introduced in the first couple of months, uh, definitely the skepticism would have been understandable, but they took their time. Uh, we have each country went through its uh, second and third phase of lockdowns. uh they have taken their time they have done their phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 trials and the trials at least uh, right now are also going and there are a lot more vaccines which are still in development so it is important that uh we believe that the governments the authorities the concerned authorities are taking all the necessary steps and they're following uh utmost standards of uh, 
say uh, how these vaccines are being uh, produced developed and uh, what the ingredients are they're doing the entire testing and everything properly and then only they give the authority they authorize it for uh, the vaccination uptake for the general public so like i said this is why i'm telling you the governments will actually not introduce because it this otherwise if the vaccines actually fail it's going to have a much more bigger social cost which is not the case right now people have started taking vaccines and so far touch wood everything is going well and it's matter of time that all of us build that confidence and we go ahead and take it mm mm-hmm. uh, paul is asking uh, is it uh, for the overall good to vaccinate everybody do the young under 40 need the vaccine when the death rate from covid in the population is very very low uh, if all the vulnerable are vaccinated then why should everybody need the vaccine paul is asking hey, again at this point of time i don't think any country is actually targeting 100% we are talking anywhere between 70 to 85% and uh, it is interesting that because 70 to 85% even that's why most of the countries have the vulnerable they have the older people the frontline workers getting the vaccination first and the older the younger ones are actually way behind in the line to get the vaccine so the step one is to actually secure your uh, people older people your people who are working on the frontline so that if not the deaths even the hospitalization rates have to drastically come down so as far as that our governments are actually taking the necessary steps mhm John perhaps you want to ask something Yes Nandi what what would be the best thing that an ordinary person could do to help you in your efforts Ordinary person do What would be the best thing that an ordinary person could do to help you in your effort Right uh, interesting question So the best thing that an ordinary person can do for himself as well as for people around him around him is to a question what they are reading just don't believe in whatever you are reading be a little curious be question what you are reading whether it is right or wrong because there are a lot of bizarre claims going there are a lot of uh, like i said the spectrum is very the line is very thin uh, there there's like it's absolutely true it's absolutely false and there is this thin line where things are little true and little false so it's very important that people question what they are reading and also when you question it just do the basic research do the fact check for yourself just go on to google because it's really the biggest fact checker that you can find and just put in the keywords and you will get the relevant news covered on that uh, topic as well so when you get those then you can be clear as to whether it is correct or not and uh, otherwise one person's uh, truth is another person's fake news thank you There is another question uh for you from Matthew. How do you best reach a skeptical or misinformed audience? Uh do online information campaigns uh do a good job countering online disinformation campaigns or do you find contact with the people is necessary? Like the example of the doctor and MMR vaccine. Um it's actually two ways. Obviously for the larger population online uh, communication is effective. That is step 1. and uh, the doctor's example was a very uh, one off case and uh, it was the demographically also it was restricted there were uh, concerted efforts from all the stakeholders which should also be replicated in the real time world like say for instance a lot of the politicians in india are trying to uh, bring in a lot of effective communication in their respective constituencies while the central government will send in uh, information as and when they seem fit on uh, social media but that kind of having one to one conversation will only improve your confidence and you can ask more questions you can uh, be more specific in asking what uh, you're worried about so that is a definite thing that nothing like if that can be done but otherwise the government should uh, not leave the efforts of doing the continuous frequent conversations with the general public and also celebrity endorsements this is where it becomes very important that if they are taking it does build in a lot of confidence in people 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the last question before a short break, uh, we will have a five minute break now. Uh, Scott and Andrew are actually discussing here. Um, what is the, the benefit of creating doubt about taking the vaccine? Like who is benefiting from this misinformation spreading? Right. It's a, an interesting question that we are also trying to debunk as fact checkers. So when we, why they do is there are multiple reasons, uh, be it so it's a joke for some people. Some people actually believe that vaccines are uh, bad for uh, human beings and they want to rub off these ideas on people. And uh, some people actually, like I said, they want to, uh, fake news is very sticky. And a lot of people will actually watch things that are bizarre or something that is out of the box. So a lot of fake videos, uh, is, I'll give you an example of Dr. Bishwarup here. He is, he claims to be a diabetic specialist in India that he knows the cure for coronavirus vaccine. And he talks about everything and everything related to vaccines, which is not, not true in any context. He, uh, he has been spreading a lot of misinformation on vaccines and his videos actually have millions of views, you know. And so he actually ends up making a lot more money than what we are trying to do by putting out truths on the internet. So yes, there are multiple yeah. reasons. And mm -hmm. media as such, they, they sensationalize news. Uh, if you read like online news as well, when there's a catchy title that, okay, this is going to, so many X number of people are affected. So doubts are always, I mean, they're creating something sticky so that there's a lot of uncertainty because every, uh, everything around is uncertain right now. So you, you never know whether who's trailing the truth to you right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you very much again for your presentation. We will answer also other questions during the discussion. And now we will have a five minutes break and then we will continue with three other presentations and a discussion. So stay with us, please. And see you at 4.50. Thank you. And thank you, Nandita, again. See you soon.
Hello, now we are back after our short break and we, will, we can continue with inspirational presentations. The next one is about the objectives of the COVID-19 disinformation and strategies for countering it. Maggie Karcivadze is an analyst of memory and disinformation studies at the Institute for Development of Freedom of Information and an invited lecturer at the Free University of Tbilisi and the Agricultural University of Georgia. She earned a master's degree in Russian studies at the University College London, where she studied as a Chilvening scholar. Maggie Karcivadze has an extensive experience of researching the history of the Soviet Union, Stalinism and related disinformation narratives in the post-Soviet space. The title of her recent research is Stalin's Cult in Georgian Culture, Colors, the development of the first official history textbook of Georgia and the emergence of Georgian Stalinism. She has also participated in numerous international conferences and published articles about the Soviet past, its legacy and contemporary Russian disinformation tendencies. Thank you very much, Maggie, uh, for being with us today. And you can start with your presentation now. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, interesting webinar and thanks to all of the speakers who made incredibly interesting um, presentations. So now I'm, I'm going to share my slides with you. So today I'm going to talk about um, general objectives of co the COVID-19 disinformation and uh, strategies for countering it, basically based on the Georgian experience because I'm working at the Georgian um, non-governmental organization and think tank um, Institute for Development and the Freedom of Information, uh, where we monitored uh, the disinformation related to the coronavirus in Georgia. So um, here I will share some of our findings with you and also the general tendencies um, of this COVID-19 disinformation in general. So uh, let's start uh, first of all with the threats of the COVID-19 disinformation. Um, why, 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 why should we consider it as a threat? First of all, like, like as the World Health Organization has mentioned, um, the outbreak of the pandemic um, and the re and the response to COVID-19 has been accompanied by a massive infodemic, as the WHO calls it. Uh, and this means that um, there was an overabundance of information um, in the society, and some of this information was true and some of it was false, but the main problem is that it has become really difficult to identify reliable and non-reliable sources of disinformation. Uh, and in the times of pandemic, it is really important for people to know which sources are trustworthy and which are not, uh, because when pe people are searching for information, for instance, about the healthcare systems or coronavirus, they need to know which sources are reliable. So the government and health officials are trying to provide authoritative information about COVID-19 and also social media platforms, um, uh, have attempted uh, to find some effective ways to promote this accurate information and to counter the widespread disinformation on social um, um, social media and uh, social media platforms. Um, uh, major threat of the COVID-19 disinformation is that, uh, first of all, it um, increases distrust towards health systems and institutions. So people no longer believe what the government says. For instance, people uh, start questioning the regulations related to the pandemic um, and um, they don't follow these regulations. And uh, another problem is the spread of skepticism and conspiracy theories and also the anti-vaccination anti movements as the previous speaker has made an incredible presentation about this tendency 
this, so I'm not going to uh, speak a lot about this anti-vaccination tendencies. But the problem is that due to the spread of this disinformation, people no longer trust, many people no longer trust the um, health, um, health uh, officials and the government officials, and they refuse to take vaccines. Um, while this um, mass vaccination can be a solution to this uh, pandemic, which is the major problem in the contemporary world. And finally, uh, like. Um, as a result of the spread of the disinformation, if many people believe in the disinformation and this conspiracy theories and anti-vaccination narratives, um, we will not be able to control the spread of the virus, which is which will be a problem because as we uh, all know, uh, this um, virus affects not only our health, but also the economy um, and the general well-being and um, uh, of people and our lives. Every aspect of our life is impacted by this um, uh, COVID-19. So it is important to find the ways to counter the disinformation. But what I, I want to argue here is to, in order to find appropriate ways for countering uh, disinformation, we must know uh, the differences between the nar disinformation narratives. Um, we should uh, identify the sources of disinformation and the general objectives of the disinformation. And when we know the exact logic of the narrative and sources and objectives of the disinformation, then it becomes much easier to find the ways for countering the disinformation. Um, a lot of research has been conducted uh, on the disinformation narratives related to the COVID-19. Um, our organization was also working on it and we also collected the information um, from other sources as well. So now, based on this um, uh, extensive research about the disinformation narratives, we can say that there are several, basically six major disinformation narratives around the coronavirus. First is that COVID-19 was created artificially in a laboratory by the United States, United Kingdom, Russia, or China. Um, like it depends on the sources and the objectives. Like uh, mainly, for, for instance, if we're speaking about Russian disinformation on COVID-19, uh, then uh, this disinformation narrative is mainly focused on anti-Western um, tendencies tendencies that this uh, COVID-19 was artificially created by the United States, for instance, to affect, to like, um, to um, uh, affect China or Russia specifically, or Iran even. Uh, another uh, major narrative, uh, widespread narrative about COVID-19 disinformation was that migrants caused the spread of the virus all uh, around the world. And basically this narrative was um, mostly spread by the ultranationalist groups, uh, even in Georgia and not only in Georgia, in the United States as well. Um, third narrative was that there were links between the COVID-19 disinformation and 5G technology. Uh, uh, fourth one was that uh, the EU and US are unable to deal with the pandemic while China and Russia have succeeded. Like uh, this kind of narrative was uh, basically promoted by the Russian and Chinese disinformation sources to delegitimize the West and spread this anti-Western narratives and promote the positive image of Chinese or Russian governments and represent them as a successful fighters uh, against coronavirus and effective crisis managers. Um, and the fifth narrative was that COVID-19 doesn't exist. Um, this 
like this kind of conspiracy theories are associated with this uh, narrative that you know, like for instance the united states um are in has invented covid 19 and wants everyone to believe in it or some um cor corporations um uh, have invented COVID-19 um, uh, to increase their income or uh, this kind of um, conspiracy theories. And finally, of course, this anti-vaccination narratives are quite common around uh, this COVID-19. Uh, here I, I have provided an example of um, a widespread disinformation narrative about uh, the links between the 5G technology and coronavirus. Um, and here you can see a screenshot from Russia Today um, article, which argues that radiation activists warns that 5G networks are massive health experiment. Um, notably, this conspiracy theories about 5G technology started much earlier um, uh, than the, the pandemic itself. Since 2019, right, for instance, Russia today became especially active uh, in spreading conspiracy theories about 5G technology. Uh, in January 2019, a video was published on YouTube in which uh, uh, the uh, RT's correspondent, Michelle Greenstein, argued that 5G technology could kill humans. And uh, notably, this video had more than 2 million views. Uh, in April 2019, the same Russia Today argued that 5G technology causes cancer uh, in children. And although by, uh, Russia Today was not the first one to uh, make links between 5G technology and coronavirus, um, pre, uh, like the conspiracy uh, theories spread by Russia Today presumably um, cre created a fertile basis for making, for creating the conspiracy theories about coronavirus and its links with the 5G technology. Um, uh, this conspiracy theories about uh, the 5G and COVID-19 started in 2020, and it was the first for the first source um, which spread this conspiracy theory was Belgian newspaper, um, which associated 5G with coronavirus, and then uh, this conspiracy theory was. Um, it was, it was spread too fast on YouTube and Facebook, and there there were uh, um, uh, five, uh, six basic directions that can be emphasized in this conspiracy theories. For, 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 first was that 5G technology is dangerous in general. The second one was that 5G technology weakens the immune system and complicates the symptoms of coronavirus. Uh, the third one was that 5G technology causes symptoms similar to coronavirus. Um, uh, the other one was that the state of emergency announced due to the, due to the coronavirus is used for installing 5G networks. Um, Fifth uh, narrative was that Bill Gates is involved in the development of 5G and coronavirus. And the final, uh, finally, uh, the situation around 5G and coronavirus uh, is a Mason uh, conspiracy. Um, and since April 2020, um, researchers of disinformation started active monitoring of uh, the disinformation narratives about the links between 5G technology and uh, coronavirus. And a lot of researchers have mentioned that um, there these um, uh, conspiracy theories about the links between 5G technology and coronavirus um, were based on coordinated social campaigns um, on social media, which means that um, 
uh, these uh, narratives were spreading. Um, so there were some tendencies um, uh, in spreading these narratives that can be associated with some kind of coordinated efforts. Like, for instance, maybe all of you have heard about the Mueller report regarding the um, Russian interference in the US um, presidential elections in 2016. Uh, and this report says that the, the, there was a Russian trace uh, and there were signs of coordinated uh, campaigns, uh, disinformation campaigns. And similar traces were evident um, with regard to the disinformation ca campaigns related to COVID-19 uh, disinformation. Um, and uh, speaking about the strategies for spreading the COVID-19 disinformation, um, uh, it can be said that both traditional and social media were used as platforms for spreading disinformation campaigns. Um, uh, however, the research on disinformation related to COVID-19 was mainly focused on uh, social media and um, um, most of this research indicate that trolls and bots were actively used on social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter, um, and Instagram also for uh, spreading the disinformation. Also fake news were actively promoted so, through social media and conspiracy theories were um, uh, another means for spreading the disinformation. And interestingly, official statements by the state officials uh, was another sort another means for spreading the disinformation uh, so therefore it can be said it can be uh, said that um, although both traditional and social media used for spreading the disinformation uh, related to coronavirus uh, mainly the social media platforms were used for um, spreading this kind of information and uh, this disinformation was uh, based both on fake news, um, conspiracy theories, official statements from um, the government officials, for instance, um, and also there were some, some traces of coordinated uh, efforts on social media for spreading the disinformation. Uh, the most uh, like um, and for instance, like when, when we talk about this coordinated campaigns, Georgian case is very interesting. When um, our organization was researching the uh, COVID disinformation in Georgia, um, we uh, tried to monitor uh, disinformation related to the links between 5G technology and coronavirus in Georgia, and we found out that um, uh, on Facebook, Facebook is most used uh, social media platform in Georgia. So we found out several Facebook groups in Georgia, um, which had, uh, like for instance, one of these groups uh, called Stop 5G Georgia uh, had uh, 21,000 members, uh, which is not a small number for Georgia. And another group had more than 6,000 members. And in these groups, uh, the disinformation about the links between 5G technology and coronavirus was actively promoted. Uh, and also the interesting aspect of the same information, uh, disinformation campaign was that um, the admins of this group also created a petition um, in Georgia and the, like the, this petition was um, the major request of this petition uh, was uh, for the Georgian government to stop implementing and um, in um, 5G technology uh, in Georgia and we also tried to um, um, look up information about uh, those individuals 
those users uh, who used to post um, a lot in these Facebook groups about the conspiracy theories about the links between uh, the 5G technology and, um, and coronavirus in Georgia. Uh, and we identified these individuals. The, these people were not fake profiles. They, the, these were actual people. And interestingly, these people were the ones uh, who have been previously uh, identified um, as um, social media actors who used to spread pro-Russian disinformation um, on um, social media and, and, and different Georgian social media platforms. So um, this was an interesting finding uh, of our research. And uh, like, if we talk about the objectives of the COVID-19 disinformation, which is the most interesting aspect of the research, because um, it's true that we we all know that there is abundance of uh, disinformation on social media as well as traditional media. But uh, like we often ask, what is the goal of this disinformation? Why would anyone need to spread this kind of disinformation, for instance, about this 5G technology? Uh, or why would anyone need to spread anti-vaccination narratives? Um, um, and uh, there are uh, four key objectives of the COVID-19 disinformation uh, based on our research. First is the polarization of the society. Like, um, this is not just our finding. Um, uh, many uh, researchers have mentioned, for, for instance, the researchers who were working on um, the study of anti-vaccination disinformation. Uh, these researchers have mentioned that um, Generally, if we speak about this anti-vaccination narratives, the major goal of these narratives is uh, the polarization in the society because, um, uh, uh, like, I don't remember who was the author of the research, but um, um, there, there is an extensive research on anti-vaccination disinformation in the United States and um, thousands of tweets were studied um, uh, about the uh, um, about vaccination in general uh, and based on the research it became came uh, clear that um, this uh, fake accounts on Twitter used to uh, spread no just anti-vaccination narratives, but uh, pro-vaccination narratives as well to so, um, um, to kind of enhance discussion uh, in the society and um, uh, create some kind of illusion that there is a disagreement in the society about vaccines. So um, this illusion about the existing disagreement in the society um, um, uh, polarizes the society and creates an illusion that the society is polarized. So this kind of nar narratives are used uh, for um, fostering uh, the polarization in the society society. Another objective of the COVID-19 disinformation can be sowing distrust toward, toward public institutions and decision makers. Um, like, for instance, in the Georgian case, uh, the, like maybe um, this uh, Russian major goal of Rus Russian disinformation um, related to the COVID um, uh, coronavirus was to sow distrust toward uh, the government officials and create an illusion that the, uh, the Georgian government is incapable of dealing the crisis um, or that um, uh, the, uh, the European Union cannot help Georgia to handle this crisis. Um, another objective of the COVID-19 disinformation can be fostering chaos in the society because um, uh, the, this might be used by the foreign government uh, for making um, the particular society more vulnerable uh, to foreign interference in the internal political discussions. And of course, the 
final objective uh, can be like foreign policy um, uh, objectives, like um, uh, for instance, promoting, um, creating fertile bases for uh, promoting anti-Western or anti-Russian or anti-Chinese um, narratives, which was um, also evident uh, in the uh, Georgian case. Um, uh, for like in the Georgian case, um, uh, Russian disinformation is the most interesting and most active. And this is why um, um, the think tanks or other research institutions that focus on disinformation studies mainly um, pay attention to Russian disinformation. And we can say for sure that uh, in terms of objectives related to um, objectives of the COVID-19 disinformation, and if we speak about Russian disinformation related to coronavirus, uh, we can say that um, the messages targeting domestic Russian audiences and international audiences were different. Like the, um, the messages is targeting domestic Russian audiences describe the virus as a form of foreign aggression. Um, and these sources claim that, for instance, the United States or other Western laboratories created this coronavirus um, uh, to attack Russia, to weaken Russia. Um, and to interfere in the um, um, in Russian affairs, um, uh, or another uh, narrative targeted at domestic Russian audiences was that um, Russia and China were dealing with crisis successfully, while uh, the Western democracy countries were incapable of um, protecting their societies. Um, and as for the messages targeting international audiences, um, these were um, basically conspiracy theories about like how um, global elites deliberately weaponized the vi virus for their um, personal interests, but also here is the difference, like uh, the messages targeted at Western audiences were mainly focused about uh, the global elites and elites interest, while the, uh, the disinformation targeted at the post-Soviet space, for instance, or Russia's uh, neighborhood was mainly focused on anti-Western narratives and th this uh, disinformation uh, campaigns also promoted uh, the idea that um, uh, the democracy countries were uh, incapable of dealing with crisis while Russia um, was successful um, in, for instance, developing the first vaccine um, uh, of uh, coronavirus. And also uh, speaking about the sources of disinformation, um, um, the sources were also different. Uh, government officials, uh, as also already mentioned, or different so sources affiliated with the government, like for instance, the um, media sponsored by, funded by the different governments, and also individual social media actors. For instance, this, when we speak about the government officials, maybe all of you remember um, the tweets from Don, former uh, US President uh, Donald Trump, um, who posted that uh, the flu also killed many people, uh, but we didn't close uh, countries because of flu, and we shouldn't close countries because of COVID. Then, the, then Twitter flagged um, uh, this tweet um, as a, and uh, here you can also see this banner um, saying that this tweet violates uh, Twitter rules, um, and um, also uh, dif different sources. Uh, um, especially the sources uh, supported by 
the um, different governments used to sp spread uh, disinformation narratives. Um, in the Georgian case, this is especially true about the sources funded by the Russian government. Uh, um, like the here, you can see, for instance, um, um, the conspiracy theory uh, about how the United States uh, government pays for the death of the citizens of Georgia. And here, the, this disinformation uh, narrative was uh, mainly about the Luger Laboratory in Tbilisi, which is sponsored by the United States. And this Luger Laboratory is the major laboratory in Georgia uh, where um, the research on coronavirus and other um, important viruses is carried out. And um, the, this was the key institution which was used in Georgia for fighting against the coronavirus. But this disinformation narratives tried to delegitimize this Luger laboratory. And um, um, uh, these sources uh, argued um, and that um, uh, the United States used this laboratory for spreading coronavirus in Georgia uh, and Russia. Um, and and other disinformation narratives used by pro-Russian disinformation sources, um, and uh, these sources have been mentioned, have been monitored uh, by our organization as well as other organizations in Georgia before. Um, and they are uh, mentioned in many reports about Russian disinformation in Georgia. So these uh, pro-Russian disinformation sources uh, used to spread um, used to spread another disinformation um, about how the Un European Union and United States were unable to help Georgia in the crisis. Um, and they used to emphasize the importance of Georgia's link, uh, links with Russia. And they tried to advoca advocate um, uh, um, uh, advocate increasing um, economic links between Georgia and Russia. Because while, as they argued, as the European Union and US were not uh, able to help Georgia in crisis, uh, Russia would be able to help Georgia. Mm, uh, mm, and we, we also published article about uh, this economic dependency of Georgia on Russia and how how these sources were trying to create fertile bases for discussions about increasing Georgia's uh, economic dependency uh, on Russia. And finally, um, um, if we talk about uh, strategies for countering the COVID-19 disease, information, uh, first of all, we all know that uh, social media platforms um, um, have taken various measures for countering uh, disinformation. Um, they work in close collaboration with um, um, health institutions and government officials to promote reliable information about coronavirus. And um, they also uh, increase the monitoring of fake news and disinformation and misinformation about coronavirus and you know, Facebook, for instance, or Twitter actively uh, delete or ban um, this kind of disinformation. But this is not enough because, for instance, in Georgia, uh, uh, for the majority of the population, the major source of information is traditional media sources. And, in, in we, and if we speak about ethnic minorities living in Georgia, for instance, the Armenian or Azerbaijani minorities uh, living in Georgia, they do not receive information from Georgian uh, information sources. They, their uh, major information um, source is Russian. Yeah. Uh, so um, in Georgia, the major challenge is to increase me media literacy in ethnic minorities, especially um, so that they will be able to 
to um, tell the difference between information and disinformation uh, and to identify reliable and non-reliable sources. And for this uh, Institute for Development of Information, our organization um, actively um, advocated uh, coordination between the public health institution, civil society, and media, because we think that this is the most important uh, for countering COVID-19 disinformation in the country. Like, uh, it, it's, uh, it's really effective when social media platforms take measures for deleting um, disinformation about COVID-19, but this is not enough. Uh, it is important for uh, public health institutions and civil society actors and media media to work, work in coordination in order to counter the disinformation narratives and promote reliable and comprehensive information about COVID-19, which is important for um, uh, stopping the spread of the virus, um, not just in Georgia, but globally as well. So um, I think I, my time um, uh, has expired. And so um, you can ask me questions now. Uh, thank you. Thank for you very much. Lisa. Thank you very much, Maggie, uh, for your interesting presentation. Yes, we are actually running out of the time, but uh, we will ask you at least one question uh, from Matt. Uh, he's asking, can you speak personally about the consequences or dangers of disinformation as a citizen of Georgia? Uh, what can you say to people who claim that disinformation is not a real threat? Um. Uh, like as already mentioned, uh, the recent public service in Georgia uh, have also revealed that this is a real problem, um, at least in Georgia, because um, uh, recent public surveys have showed that more than 60% um, of the public of Georgia believe in this anti-vaccination narratives and refuse to take this COVID-19 vaccine. So this is problem. If people refuse to uh, uh, get this vaccine, we will not be able to stop the pandemic. So at least um, in this case, uh, the disinformation related to COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccine is a real problem. And also if uh, uh, the public um, trust toward government officials and health institutions decreases, uh, this means that at some point, people will st stop um, following the regulations or guidelines um, um, implemented by the Georgian government uh, and also uh, health institutions, which will make the situation related to COVID-19 uncontrollable. So uh, this is why I think that the disinformation is a real problem. And also, as I've mentioned, it also has foreign policy applications. Generatives can create a fertile basis uh, for enhancing anti-Western and pro-Russian uh, attitudes in the society. So I think that the governments of different countries um, and people in general and civil society should perceive this kind of disinformation seriously and work in coordination uh, to uh, um, elaborate effective strategies for countering the disinformation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Maggie. So we can also discuss uh, other questions during the discussion. So we can now introduce our next speaker. Thank you again, Maggie. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Matthew Verick. I will just share his biography so you can see it. 
Uh, Matthew Verick founded uh, the, this information project, a startup nonprofit operating in the Commonwealth in Virginia, with his 16 year old after realizing the extent to which teens were negatively impacted by a steady stream of noise online. Already aware of the use of disinformation by authoritarian states for population control, he has become increasingly concerned by the scale and reach of disinformation made possible by information technology. He is soon to retire from active duty with the United States Navy and lives in Virginia with his wife and three teenage children. Thank you very much, Matt, for being with us today. And you can start now with your presentation. Great, thank you, Vladka. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And you can tell that by the statements in the introduction that this is a very personal um, issue for me with three teenagers at home. Um, and I've been motivated to, as I watch them develop, um, to help other teenagers who are dealing with the same consequences of this noise or disinformation on the internet or social media. So thank you and hello from Virginia. I normally speak fast, but I'll try to slow the pace so I can be well heard. I appreciate your patience with that. I am Matt Verich, co-founder and CEO of the Disinformation Project, a nonprofit committed to raising awareness and helping teenagers defend against disinformation and its harmful effects. And let me just pull my screen up and get started. Perfect, we can see that. Yeah, great. So first, a disclaimer, I am speaking as a private citizen, and this has nothing to do with uh, the US government where I'm still employed as a Naval officer, at least for a few months until I retire. And this also is a US perspective. It's been very interesting all morning long for me to hear the various perspectives from Europe and India. And, and it's just interesting to, to get the nuances for how disinformation is affecting each of us in our own context and what uh, solutions we might be thinking about uh, to uh, combat it or tackle it. Uh, with this presentation, I hope to share <clears throat> our perspectives on the disinformation crisis and how we are responding as a nonprofit in education and services organization focused on students in United States high schools. I think many of you have a handle on what disinformation is, but I wanted to share this particular de definition because it illustrates the change or the evolution in my personal thinking uh, about this, which speaks to the motivation to do more to combat it, especially focusing on, on young people. You'll see in the first use of the word, disinformation is something states do against other states, part of a game to gain advantage over an adversary. For most of my career in national security, this is exactly how I viewed disinformation. Thus, I was trained and learned how to identify it and to think up ways to counter it, but only in the context of militaries versus other militaries, or from the perspective of state intelligence agencies doing something in the background, behind the scenes, and not connected directly with most citizens in the general population. More recently, I've come to understand that this, this definition isn't sufficient, which brings us to the second use of the word. Sure, state-on-state -state disinformation remains a national security problem, and you've heard many of ex examples of that already today, perhaps now more than ever. But there are many more actors involved now, and there are new dynamics driving the scale and the reach of disinformation, making it, in my view, more dangerous and involving everyday citizens, not just an elite group of experts. Indeed, we have heard today that disinformation is not just a national security threat to liberal democracies, but a public threat as well, a public health threat as well. And when I reference public health, I mean two sides of the same coin. Disinformation can challenge broad public health policies, as in the example of COVID vaccinations. On the other side, disinformation has a real consequence to the mental health of individuals. Take, for example, some of the participants in the rampage on the Capitol building in Washington, DC on January 6th. 
many of them have come out recently and claimed that they had been duped. Or one of our Congresswomen, uh, Congresswoman Green of, in our House of Representatives, who was stripped of her committee assignments because she, in her own words, came to believe and promote conspiracies on social media that weren't true and for which now she regrets. We know the mental health of teens is already compromised by social media addictions, increasing depression and alienation, and disinformation plays a role in this phenomenon. I think John's comments about uh, the difference between being cynical and skeptical are relevant here, as a very cynical population is not one that has a lot of trust and positivity for, for a bright future. Let's turn to a real world example of a disinformation campaign. This one, like we heard in the last uh, presentation by Maggie, happens to be a Russian state disinformation campaign that has both national security and public health implications. This case comes straight from an excellent report published in August of, August of last year by the US State Department's Global Engagement Center, which has set up specifically to counter disinformation. You can see the reference on the slide and I encourage all of you to download this report uh, readily available on the internet so you can read it in full. The report identifies five pillars of what it names Russia's disinformation ecosystem. Each pillar by itself may not be all that effective, but a well-organized campaign that includes elements of all five pillars is extremely effective at meeting political objectives. The single example on the slide served multiple Russian objectives involving the US's relationship with Georgia. I don't wanna get into the geopolitics of this and Maggie did an excellent job explaining why this is a problem there and, and, and elsewhere. But I wanted to focus, it, uh, focus on this example as a explanation of how disinformation campaigns work in the real world. In the first pillar, official government statements, we see a Russian general speaking in an official capacity at a press conference claiming falsely that the US has a secret bioweapons program in Georgia. This image was from Reuters coverage of that story. The same theme is picked up by Sputnik News in the second pillar, state funded propaganda outlets in various languages and global outlets, giving the official comments more reach and adding analysis to the chosen narrative. The third pillar is a bit more subtle. It involves state funded research organizations such as Global Research, which repeats similar claims under the guise of objective research with no obvious connection to the state of Russia or official uh, sources, but which is used to disseminate fake research, giving those statements an air of credibility. Then in the fourth pillar, weaponization of social media, we see the power and reach of social media as bots or trolls use various methods to spread the theme of the secret US bioweapons program in Georgia adding emotional commentary about what the story says about the relationship between America and Georgia, et cetera. This image is of the internet research agency in St. Petersburg, Russia, which was determined to be a Russian company engaged in online influence operations on behalf of Russian business and political interests. Finally, Russia can mobilize its cyber warfare infrastructure to attack Georgian government websites, for example, using the public stories about bioweapons as justification or to further spread the themes in even more subtle ways. This case becomes in the 21st century of information technology, like a blueprint for states to coordinate false narratives across multiple outlets to spread disinformation. Some experts, especially those that are more focused on the first definition that we had uh, up there, uh, uh, state on state propaganda will say, okay, well, Maybe some new tools are at play, but is this fundamentally new? Is there anything that we haven't seen before? And to that, I say, we, this, is, this is new. This is similar, uh, but much different than what we've seen before. Technology is just one of the differences that has emerged since dis disinformation was adopted by the Soviets shortly after the Bolshevik Revolution. Now we are seeing disinformation campaigns by private citizens, fringe social groups, political parties. I won't go through all the details here on this slide, but what the chart represents is an explosion of disinformation fueled by technology as an effective tool for control. 
I want to highlight just one of the references on this chart for those that are really interested in this, in that report by the Brookings Institute titled, How Disinformation Evolved in 2020. There are many more reports like this, but this is a good one uh, in a good way to understand uh, what I'm claiming here. So let's talk about the dynamics that bring disinformation into focus in 2021. First, the rise of information technology. I think all of us understand that generally more people have access to more information than ever before. That is mostly a good thing, but an unintended consequence is that there is more noise than ever before. And people are frankly overwhelmed by options, choices, new ideas, some real, some false, but all getting indiscriminate attention on our screens. This, many have argued, has led to a decline in journalism and trusted sources. Part of this, I believe, is a decline in journalistic quality and standards among previously trusted media organizations. And that's due to the competition for subscribers that's growing because there are many more players in the market. But more importantly, I think, is the decline in journalism's cognitive reach because of the explosion of choices out there and frankly, just more noise that I referenced earlier. Another dynamic driving the crisis is the social media business model. By this, I mean the idea that we, the public, get free access to services in return for data characterizing our preferences and behaviors, which is then sold to the highest bidder, usually to advertisers representing companies, political parties, organizations, and even governments. How does that relate to disinformation, you might ask? Well, researchers have shown that we spend a lot of time consuming and sharing information that has high emotional value. And therefore, that content draws revenue, which then promotes it even higher in the sorting algorithms, and thus begins a vicious cycle. Remember the weaponization of social media pillar from the slide before. One can argue that the social media platforms have a financial incentive to spread disinformation and that users are useful but unwitting participants. Another key driver is the geopolitical situation with rising powers with different views of the world challenging the Western dominated political and economic system that has existed since the end of World War II. This competition is manifesting itself as a competition of ideas, a struggle for the hearts and minds of various groups. It is important who wins this competition, which is fought in the information domain. The stakes indeed are high. Lastly, we are at the beginning of an information arms race. That is, as we wake up to the fact we are being attacked by technology-driven disinformation campaigns, we are fighting back with tech-fueled information campaigns, counter-narratives, fact-checkers, labels, sources of information that compete with the alternative sources of information. Again, adding to the noise. There have been some bright spots, some proof that these tactics can be effective. I don't wanna diminish the success in these areas. But we think that these measures may also be just adding to the noise and, and not reaching the audience as, as cleanly or directly as they, that they, that they might. Fighting fire with more fire while Rome burns the opposite of Nero's problem of doing nothing. We think these information technology-based tactics will only work when the users, everyday citizens, the public, have developed more fundamental skills to discern truth from fiction. Said another way, the information arms race is like uh, restaurateurs fighting over who has the better recipe or kitchen tools, but forgetting that there are no patrons or even cooks in the kitchen. All of these things were already conspiring against us with the dawn of these new information technologies, but then in 2020 made much worse by a couple of conditions that drew more people online, further divided by information bubbles or like-minded strangers. And that of course is the global pandemic and at least in the US context, the US presidential election cycle. Okay, we end then with what are we doing about it? I think we all know the problem exists and uh, I hope you can accept that 
this is a crisis worth putting some energy behind solving. I also hope that you can accept or appreciate that as a society, we simply aren't doing enough about it. And the, cons the consequences of that inaction are dire in the national security and public health dimensions. We believe that the greatest hope for a solution lies in changing online culture and behaviors. This idea begins with the recognition that the very th things we choose to do out of convenience or out of desire to connect or out of social pressure to be engaged or out of boredom or maybe out of necessity, necessity or any number of reasons why people engage socially online are the same behaviors being exploited by those wishing to control us or otherwise do us harm through disinformation. To combat this in a durable way, a way that avoids the trap of the disinformation arms race, we need to think strategically, recognize dis disinformation as a long-term problem that will change along with the technology and the technological countermeasures used to fight it. Research, again, has been immensely helpful in understanding this. We know, for example, that simply raising awareness and employing behavior change goes a long way to taking the fuel away from a disinformation campaign that is going viral. These strategies also inoculate people from getting sucked into a disinformation campaign in the first place. It's hard to get influenced by a message that you don't encounter. For these reasons, we elected to focus on teenagers. We see this population as having the greatest hope for sustainable culture and behavior change. We think this is the best demographic to target with respect to improving trust in quality journalism and in our civic institutions. And we see this population as most receptive to, and indeed most in need of, learning digital life skills, those behaviors that will be valuable for the rest of their lives, many of which we referenced already today about how to engage and interact in a responsible way online. Similar to teaching personal finance skills or as important as teaching the basic subjects like math, reading, the arts and sciences. If I can direct your attention to the graphic on this slide, this is my uh, probably really bad PowerPoint attempt to summarize who we are and what we hope to achieve in a picture. In the cloud, happening at an extremely high expert level and growing, uh, thankfully, is the community of academics, government officials, experts, and institutions doing the great work to define the disinformation problem in the context of the 21st century. These are also the people <clears throat> responsible for responding to bad actors and for doing what they can to enhance the trust of our institutions. We appreciate this work, but don't see ourselves joining in this space. Rather, our aim is to help translate the issues to teens, make the best work done in the cloud more accessible so we can raise awareness more effectively and explore mitigation strategies. We started with one high school in one state, but our model is built to scale. Supporting and nurturing one chapter is as easy as supporting hundreds or thousands. We believe that teenagers, more aware teenagers, will develop innovative approaches that will inform policymakers and that this virtuous cycle will help inoculate the public and steal the energy from the crisis. Individuals can take back control, but they need skills and education to do so. This is our gamble, and we're happy to throw our time and talent behind this cause to build a better digital future. And I'll leave you with just one more example, this one involving a partisan political movement based on false information to overturn the US presidential election. This case contains many of the same attributes as the earlier example involving Russia. In this case, self-declared experts with wild theories about why President Trump lost somehow managed to spin a tale involving Italy, leftist officials in the US embassy in Rome, the Italian firm Leonardo Satellite Constellation, and rigged voting machines in Georgia. <clears throat> Social groups, including the great game India, a self-described 
online journal on geopolitics and international relations. And maybe Nandita has some uh, um, experience with this particular uh, website. And I think the site has changed, frankly, now, thankfully, uh, hopefully shut down. But an earlier inspection of the site revealed no reliable information on funding, no hint of ownership or the like, and was filled with stories that could easily be debunked or discredited. There was, however, a very prominent uh, PayPal button where you could, you could support their, their great work in forming the world. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll end my, my comments there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, so now we have space for the questions from the audience. And I would like to ask you as well, uh, what do you think personally? Is uh, this information really a big deal or is it something what has been with us uh, also before and will be here forever? Well, to answer your, your second part first, I think it will be here forever. It is, um, it's been around a long time and probably forever and will be and will remain. But the problem I think we have now is that it's a bigger deal than it needs to be or a bigger deal than it might have been or, or should be because of the dynamics that I talked about, the changing technology and uh, the, the, uh, the reach and the scale uh, of the, and the effectiveness of disinformation. If it weren't effective, frankly, people wouldn't be so uh, keen to, to engage in it, but it, but it certainly uh, has we, we've certainly seen that that's that's not the case. Uh, yeah, it, it's an it's a very important again. I think it's a national security uh, concern. I also think it's a public health concern, as, as I mentioned. I think it's a uh, it's probably one of the more important things um, that we in, in the context of the United States, it, our citizens uh, should be thinking about right now, and that's why we're motivated to to get involved. And do you think that uh, should uh, big tech companies be forced to label or remove this information? This is an open question I don't have an answer to. I, I, have, I have some some opinions on, I don't have a, a good answer to. I, I, I hope researchers are looking carefully at this and deeply, and I hope policymakers are very, thinking deeply about the, the consequences and the benefits of, of whatever um, measures they might be, be um, be taking against these companies. I, I think in some ways the big tech, tech companies are the um, sort of the, the excuse or the red herring out there that everybody wants to blame, but this is a human problem and the humans are responsible for, for developing the disinformation campaigns and the humans are responsible for uh, what they do with that information or, or disinformation, whether they spread it or believe it or, or what, what have you. Um, I'm with John, I, I think on this, uh, his comments earlier. I don't. I don't think censorship is is the is the way to go, and I, I think as you start talking about labels and 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 other technical tools, you can to um, uh, sort information. I, it just adds to an uh, the, the, it adds to already a very distrustful uh, uh, society. Um, it, it, I, it's I, again that's why I call the information um, uh, arms race. I, I don't think you're really gonna see much progress. I think you'll just sort of see a, a, a point, counterpoint, point, counterpoint, but people will, will retreat to their safety, which is uh, other people who think like them. And it doesn't really matter what Twitter or anybody else labels as true or, or not true. Mm -hmm. And why have you decided to focus on teenagers? So again, I think this is a long-term problem. And I think that we have to start at an earlier generation. And I think this is also the really the first generation, um, our current teenage population that grew up literally with, with, with uh, uh, social media in their hands uh, from, from, from the day they were born practically. Um, so they, 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 they require these skills more than anybody else, frankly. And uh, there's no other way for them to get them. Uh, somebody has to teach them how to um, choose the right behaviors, how to think critically, um, how to just understand the basic uh, technology and how it works so that they don't inadvertently find themselves promoting something that just isn't true. And I think it's also uh, a, a population that's more deeply affected from a mental health perspective um, and requires our help. 
to to understand the problem, define it for them, and, and help them get get beyond it. Thank you very much, Matt, for being with us, for sharing your project with us, and uh, I hope we will stay for the discussion. Thank you. Thank and you. now it's time uh, to introduce our last speaker. And um, our last speaker is Oikun Huma Keskin. Uh, she is based in Turkey and she graduated from uh, the Department of English Language and Literature and also completed the Art History Minor Program. During her undergraduate education, she voluntarily contributed to Edebiat magazine and worked as an intern at Ugur Mumku Investigative Journalism Foundation. She is interested in analog photography and keen about health and science journalism. For nearly one year, she is a part of Tate's content team, and in October, she was elected as Facebook Health Disinformation Fellow in Turkey. She struggles with suspicious and false information that threatens public health. Thank you very much, Akun, for, for being with us today, and you can start with your presentation. Uh, hello, everyone, but uh, I can't open my uh, camera. Can you please uh, open? Yes, it should work now. Uh, okay. Try again. Yes. Perfect. Hello, Akun. So you can start to share your screen. Yeah, I'm sharing now. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, I can see. Perfect. Okay. Uh, good evening from Turkey, everyone. Uh, can you please wait a minute? I think uh, I need to just change the other thing. I'm just renew the sharing. I should stop and... Okay. Now you should see, right? Yes, we can see the presentation. Okay. Uh, hello again. I'm Öykün Keskin from Tates.org. I am a health fact checker and I am among the health disinformation fellows in the framework of Facebook a year long fellowship program to tackle health disinformation. I hope the panel is going well for everyone. Uh, by the way, I would like to thank to Vladka uh, who invited me to this panel. Uh, it is a wonderful panel and we are in the last presentation. I hope you have the energy to listen to me. Here it's our great team. As states, we have tried to monitor the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the information ecosystem from the first days of the pandemic closely. We prioritized the claims regarding the new coronavirus because they are critical for public health. We keep going our efforts to purify the information ecosystem from misinformation as much as we can. Here, as you can see the table of contents, we will start with the concept of infodemic. During COVID-19 pandemic, we have heard the concept of infodemic a lot. In order to understand the, this, uh, the health disinformation and fight against it, firstly, we should talk about infodemic. Infodemic can be defined as the blend of information and epidemic that typically refers to rapid and far-reaching spread of accurate and inaccurate information according to WHO. There is one thing to be aware of here. Infodemic does not only consist of mis or disinformation. Too much information and confusion in a specific area can also create an infodemic. So uh, we can list the four characteristics of infodemic like that. Infodemic consists of too much information and terminological terms, which is hard to understand. And infodemic is complicated. So very basically, we should decrease the amount of confusion. We need to translate the technical terms about health. And sure, we need to fact check every information. Uh, let's focus on why is infodemic that much dangerous and why we should pay attention for it. As far as I remember, one of the audience also asked a question about the subject and I hope it will be helpful. Almost every day, non-experts make many claims about health and science on social media and television. 
but we cannot digest false, complex, technical and excessive amount of information. This situation is uh, more risky during the COVID-19 days because people make their decisions based on the information they are exposed to. And wrong health decisions can be painful. Due to the false decisions, a false sense of security can occur. False sense of security means a feeling of being safer than one really is. If you believe that garlic can prevent coronavirus, you can also suppose that you don't need to wear a mask because eating garlic is enough to prevent. For instance, a woman in China who believed this misinformation ate too much garlic and she was hospitalized. Infodemic can uh, deepen mistrust in institutions and it can cause polarization. So infodemic makes problems unsolved. In this sense, we can say that the COVID-19 infodemic creates some kind of racism and discrimination against Asians and especially to the Chinese people. Because of misinformation that the virus is derived from bad soup, many people have developed hate speech against the Chinese people. Uh, that's why infodemic is harmful and we should pay attention to deal with it. Uh, as state team, uh, we were wondering how the information ecosystem was affected by the pandemic in Turkey. Our team did seek an answer to this question in July with the help of Tandan's data science consultancy. We conducted with 1,025 uh, internet users and we tried to understand the attitudes of individuals towards pandemic. In the study, the participants were asked when they encountered the most misinformation during the pandemic. Answers pointed mainly to the outbreak of the first period and the virus just before entering Turkey officially. 54% answered about the reasons behind the emergence of virus. The reason for this may be that there is not enough information about the effects and treatment methods of the virus. Uh, another impression that we got was the possible damage caused by expert inflation in the news and the TV programs. Oftentimes, the programs that seriously polluted the information ecosystem hosted people who had no expertise extra on the subject for sure. This environment where astrologers could convey comments and give advice on pandemic could be terrifying for those uh, who, for us who are busy with misinformation. Uh, in this study, we saw how effective television is in the disinformation epidemic, and we have taken action to disseminate correct information. Uh, the report mobilized us to common problem of incorrect information on television, and we have made a collaboration with Turkey's biggest TV channels, Habertürk. The channels showed our fact-checking videos on TV. For example, we created some videos about popular disinformations, manipulated images, or fake treatment methods. Here you can see an example. I know it's in Turkish, but uh, I just want to show it. Uh, as fact checkers, we have struggled to spread the correct information in this disinformation epidemic. But what are the types of these mistakes we encountered the most? First one is misleading images, documents, and maps. This one includes content where scenes from movies, TV series are presented as if they are real or where previously recorded images are shared as if they were from COVID-19 pandemic. For example, it was claimed that the Simpsons screenwriters leave the coronavirus emerging in China beforehand. However, in the episode, the virus came from Japan, not China, and the disease in the series was called as Osaka flu. 
And secondly, as I said before, the most exposed period of misinformation was when the virus had just emerged. The reason for this may be that there is not enough information. For this reason, many claims have been made under the various titles, such as the characteristics of the virus, its effects, or the duration of life on the surfaces. Thirdly, probably the suspicious treatment methods popularized to protect someone from the virus also had potential to threaten some people's health. The most common claims in this title are miraculous food that are believed to protect from the, from the virus. For example, it has been claimed that consuming lemon cure, coffee, tonic, grape vinegar will protect against COVID-19. We have used scientific research and statements from reliable health authorities as sources for such miraculous food claims. And lastly, we have struggled with conspiracy theories. These include claims that the virus is produced in a laboratory and the real cause of the disease is not the virus. Conspiracy theories are a very difficult area to verify or falsify something. Uh, in this case, we convey the truth with scientific evidences and facts. But it was a little challenging to do without underestimating the beliefs of uh, beliefs and logic of those who believe in the theories. Therefore, it's possible to say that uh, one of the most challenging issues in the process is conspiracy theories. Uh, in this panel, the vaccine opposition was mentioned very deeply. Thank you, Nandita. Uh, it was really great presentation. Uh, also, I want to add a few things in this field. Uh, and vaccination is an area where we struggle because disinformation in this area can cause people to disgrace from vaccines. Uh, vaccine refusal and hesitancy has become even more dangerous with the COVID-19 pandemic. The number of people who hesitate, hesitate to vaccine or who have doubts or who refuse vaccines completely may reach a size that endangers the immunity of society. In fact, uh, most of the people do not refuse vaccines altogether in Turkey. They have uh, some kind of doubts. Uh, these doubts often center around a distrust of governments, not science. And another reason for suspicion is that COVID-19 vaccines have been developed in a very short time. Uh, to clear up such doubts uh, and spread the correct information about vaccines, I have interviewed vaccine skeptics and people uh, said that they want to hear more voices from, from scientists and that vaccine development processes needed to be more transparent. In that way, vaccine hesitancy uh, can be decreased. Uh, as stated, one of the most important things we care about when tackling with infodemic is to create communities that combat infodemic. In this sense, I want to tell you a little bit about our community-based strategies. When the epidemic came uh, close to the door, we came to the conclusion that we should do more than just verify in order to leave anything, uh, le uh, leave everything to content produced by those who are false, unscientific, unscientific and who try to benefit from people's concerns. We agreed as a team in the newsletter format. Our goal is to provide users uh, with the correct information in enough dosage without a throughout the pandemic. For this reason, we designed a newsletter flow that will be sent to uh, two days a week. Uh, we included our readers in this process by asking many questions besides the experience of reading the newsletter. From time to time, we showed them new developments and we explained the ways to combat infodemic. Even we gave them food recipes uh, or book recommendations to make them mentally healthy. So we were able to build a community that struggles with infodemic. 
And EMSA is European Medical Student Association in Turkey. We care about collaborating with medical students because in Turkey, medical students are seen as doctors of the future and people have great confidence in what they say. Here we aim to identify public health related false information with medical students and to ensure that the correct information is widespread in the field of public health. Meanwhile, we provide EMSA uh, with fact checking trainings and help them equip with accurate information. Uh, cooperating with young people is very important to us. In this way, both their media literacy level increases and we create communities that struggle with disinformation. And we are in uh, contact with other university students. Students of the Iz Izmir University of Economics have worked on three different projects. First one is monitoring anti-vaccine groups. Here, our aim is to understand the anti-vaccine group and tackle them in a stronger and better way. Uh, the second group hand, uh, hand, handled complex medical terminology that can lead to false information. And the last group engaged with the false pieces of information on Wikimedia. Most of us uh, have already talked about their suggestions. And in the last part of the presentation, I want to talk a little bit about the ways to become immune to the pandemic disinformation. Of course, uh, doubt is the primary and indispensable part of fact checking. Skepticism and doubt is an awareness of the potential for manipulation and a desire to accurately understand the truth. For this, it's very important to be critical while browsing on social media. Before accepting the information as it is, it is useful to pause and pass through it from a logic filter. And our tendency to believe misinformation can increase in times of intense emotion. Our intense emotions can sometimes cause us not to distinguish between right, or right and wrong. And it's too normal, but we can go through it. That's why we need an instinctive bump. Just like in COVID-19 time, we may believe without any doubt because we are afraid. Actually, the solution is to chase forward. We should digest information by harnessing our emotions. Especially uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many people uh, released a lot of information about COVID-19 and this caused people to be confused. Some of them were true and some of them are false. But in that situation, complexity is more dangerous. We may be faced with questions such as whom to believe. In fact, the important thing is here, if the doctor is reliable, uh, or the source uh, is reliable. Uh, and the source is an expert in the field and what he or she says is based on a scientific basis. That's why we should listen to experts, not people that we have come across on the social media. Uh, I have just mentioned in the previous slide that voicing from too many people causes a lot of confusion. Of course, we should follow the developments about the pandemic around us, but it may not be good for us to stick with too much detail. That's why it's necessary to consume news in a dosage, in a enough dosage. It's important to consume news in enough dosage to prevent infodemic. It's normal that the more news we consume, the more confused our minds. minds. And it's best to get enough information from reliable sources uh, while, so, while, while uh, you know, searching on the social media. And lastly, uh, what to do if someone we know shares false information? Of course, we have to show them the truth and support them from what sources they can get reliable information. 
But here we need to pay attention to the fact that the warnings we will do should be polite and measured. In this way, we don't break anyone's health, uh, health while spreading the correct information. And we came to the end of the panel, I think. Thank you for the listening to me. It was really great to do, uh, meet you all. Uh, you can contact me via my email address uh, written here. And if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask me now, or uh, we can talk uh, at the discussion part. Uh, see you at the discussion part. Thank you very much, Okum, for a very interesting presentation. And thank you to all the participants staying with us until the almost end of the webinar. Uh, so now we have space for the, the questions. So please ans ask the question to Oikum. I would like to ask you also a few things. Uh, so what do you suggest uh, to journalists uh, while reporting during the COVID-19 days? Uh, actually, uh, journalists are a natural part of the healthcare system uh, while reporting uh, in COVID-19 days. Uh, because um, health reporting is a field that needs to be exercised, I think um, health literacy will be great for journalists because, you know, uh, sometimes um, it can be very difficult to understand scientific developments for journalists. And um, feel free to consult a doctor or an expert for, for any information because journalists and scientists in this field should uh, feed and uh, feed each other and contra contract and it's important to uh, use a plain and calm and understandable language that is not uh, pro uh, proactive in health and especially uh, vaccination news and lastly uh, follow the science and don't forget to fact check what you report mm -hmm. thank you for, for your answer also, you were mentioning uh, some of your popular types of misinformation during the pandemic. So what's your favorite false claim? Uh, well, actually, I, I do love engaging with fake treatment methods. For instance, in, in Turkey, it was claimed that applying butter to your nose protects you from COVID-19. And it was a doctor who claimed that. Uh, interesting, but every day um, a claim about a new food emerge, and I don't know why, but I think um, we need to understand why uh, people want to believe in fake treatment, and uh, I love showing people uh, to uh, correct information in this field. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and the last question, what is the most challenging for you uh, when it comes to fact checking, to fact checking? Uh, in fact, uh, I think it's really hard to deal with uh, conspiracy theories because, uh, but uh, it's also enjoyable at the same time because it's very difficult to prove something that does not exist. And uh, doing so, we shouldn't hurt uh, those who believe it because it can create a backfire uh, effect. And the balance is really hard uh, here and we should really uh, think about the balance. Therefore, I can uh, again recommend uh, to be rational and measured and not to be surprised by the uh, correct information. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much Akum, again for your presentation and also for your answers. You can stay with us. Uh, now we will have actually uh, 20 minutes for uh, discussion. So I would like to ask all our speakers to actually uh, turn on their cameras so we can discuss some topics. I will also share the discussion topics with you. So hi, I can see that you are here. Great. So you can also unmute. Perfect. So thank you again for all the great presentations. We have now uh, around 20 minutes for a discussion. Uh, so I would like to ask you, we were discussing actually already uh, this topic related to the content, content regulation rules. So um, what do you think, what, what's your opinion on this? Uh, what, is the, what do you think about the legal fight against fake news versus censorship? And what should we do actually to really fight 
uh, this, this information? What should be the tools? And if there is any, perhaps when it comes to European Union, if there is any legislation uh, to, to counter misinformation, should we give some fines or what are your opinion? So uh, perhaps, uh, John, you can start with, with your answer. Okay, so I, th I mean, there's a, the thing that's different between now and um, Carl Sagan's time is that we have all this internet stuff and social media which effectively gives the tools for anybody to be a publisher and get their message out uh, uh, across the world. And we've been very slow. I think, you know, governments and people in general have been very slow in um, introducing some regulation into that uh, arena. I mean, if you go back 100 years or so, you'll find that the newspaper barons of New York uh, you know the Bloombergs or whatever those say. They, they, you know, they produce stories about men on the moon and you know stuff on Mars. You know, absolute rubbish. Uh, and uh, they put it in their newspapers to sell papers. And then eventually, governments got involved in this and they introduced some regulation. And you have broadcast codes and newspaper codes and press codes and press regulation uh, authorities. Now, um, it's still the wild west in the uh, in the internet sphere so i think there's um definitely some work that needs to be done in that area and it's good that uh, uh companies uh, like facebook and twitter are now employing lots of fact checkers and and doing work in that uh, uh arena i'm i'd be interested to know because we've got a couple of people on the panel who are uh, in effect government employees or employees of agencies that are funded by governments or government establishments I think secrecy is a big friend of the conspiracy theorist. So wherever there's a secret, you'll find a conspiracy theorist will create stories to fill the void that that secret uh, of that government secret that exists. And uh, especially maybe Matthew worked in the um, uh, in the military. You know what is the role for governments and intelligence services and keeping government secrets moving moving forward? I'd be really interested to hear about that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Perhaps Matthew, you can answer if you if you want. Well, I, I, I look. I, you're absolutely right. I mean, but I, I don't know if there's a if there's a lesson there or if there's a um, the U U.S. government, for example, is one of the most open, transparent mm -hmm. governments out there. It, there aren't many secrets that we can keep, even if we wanted to, um, <laughs> because they're because they're leaked all the time, or because uh, various people have agendas and they want to, you know. Um, tell their story. I mean, there, there hasn't been a government official that left high office in America that hasn't written a tell-all book uh, after leaving the office. I mean, there, there just isn't much out there that is so secret that's going to generate any reasonable sort of conspiracy theory. But 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 you're right, they're, they're out there. I, I don't think there's anything the government can do to kind of tamp that down. I, I am, I am, I am, it's my opinion to, it's my inclination to avoid uh, a heavy hand in this area, avoid re heavy handed regulation, avoid censorship or anything that could be perceived as censorship, because I think it makes the problem worse. We have to start with the user, the human at the other end or at the end of the message that is actually going to do something or think something or promote something um, that is harmful and, and give them the skills to be more discerning, to be more uh, cautious to be more careful about how they interact with information. It is a wild west. And you know, I, I read Ben Franklin's uh, biography recently and everybody knows, you should know Ben Franklin, one of our founding fathers and great statesmen was a publisher. His first, his first life and his only love was publishing. Ben Franklin published false stories all the time. Yeah. <laughs> part of it was entertainment and part of it was politically motivated or motivated to help a friend or whatever, or to, or mostly profit motivated to sell more newspapers. He sold more newspapers in the colonies than anybody uh, else. Um, but, it, and, and so there has been a, 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 an evolution in journalistic standards to account for that. I, in other words, I think the market will correct. I think at some point, if you have a discerning user base, market forces will sort of take the air out of the uh, disinformation that's really running rampant right now 
and sort of promote more authoritative sources. But you have to have that foundation first. People have to be able to make that choice. Right now, people aren't making the choice because they don't know they even have a choice. They're just they're just trying to deal with this this massive amount of noise out there, and they're doing the best they can, but they don't even realize how insidious these sort of nuanced messages are and how they sort of uh, isolate and insulate themselves in these bubbles, as you said, John, and I, I totally agree with that, um, and how harmful that is over time. It, it, I've, I know people who have put themselves in a bubble and don't even know they're in a bubble. <laughs> it until until they're literally smacked across the head with something really um, uh, unfortunate or you know some crisis or something like that. They they have no idea that they've been sort of slipping down this very uh, 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 nuanced slope that for the last couple of years, and they now find themselves completely isolated in a, a way of thinking that is out of touch with reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nandita, what's your opinion? What do you think about uh, the content regulation rules as you're working in factly? Maybe you have a different opinion or also vision. Uh, no, I actually do agree with uh, what Matthew had just said. It is actually more dangerous because when you impose a rule as that, it just erodes more uh, trust on uh, government institutions, the media as such people will take two steps back and not trust what we have been doing so far as well. Because when you cut off everything at one go, they know something is actually wrong. Whereas you're trying to do something else. So it's going to be a complete disaster if such a thing is in place. In fact, uh, there was uh, an interesting regulation that had uh, come in place in context of India. In the southern part of India, the Kerala state, there was a Kerala Police Act, where they said that if people post blatant disinformation, they'll actually be jailed for it. But they received a huge backlash against it, saying that they are uh, infiltrating the freedom of speech and uh, who is going to decide whether the news is true or false. The gray area is the question and uh, who's going to do that and how do you authenticate the sources and the implementation is going to be a huge task even if such an enforcement is in place. And that has clearly backfired in the context of India. So I don't think that's gonna work. And that is where I think fact checkers become all the more important because they are the ones who are trying to tell you uh, with, without any political inclination, they're trying to give you what the fact is and what the misinformation and disinformation is about. And that's why I said it has to come to an individual level where everyone is questioning and doing their own fact check. So that is exactly how you improve the consciousness as a society and you evolve towards fact checking. That's my take on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anneli, perhaps you could say also your opinion on this question. Yes, thanks a lot. So, I mean, my only advice would be maybe to follow the like the progress of uh, where the EU is going with this issue on the Digital Services Act uh, and partly also the U Euro European Democracy Action Plan. Um, as I think that like there is quite wide consensus that it should not be like clearly there is a discussion about platforms regulation in the like on the EU level, like what should be done with the platforms. Uh, but it's not focused on the content regulation. So I think that 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 is in a way agreed uh, quite widely that it should not be about the content but instead it should be like split into different areas of, for example, like, okay, so how do we ensure that the algorithms are not uh, discriminating? How do we ensure the data access to, to researchers or civil society? How do we ensure the like users right to, for the access of accurate information? So that you have like a different access points to this and, and different parts of the regulation and you don't approach it as like, okay, so now we will just attack false content because that is 
proven to be quite a difficult starting point uh, to this. And I mean, okay, so then there is the question of, of we have like different platforms that we have the, you know, the US based platforms, and then we have several other platforms like Telegram, like TikTok, uh, that are by nature, um, you know, uh, of conductor, uh, very different than run by by uh, Russian actors or Chinese. Um, so, like, I, I think there is a long, like, a long regulatory way to to really get into the, uh, you know, in into the end of this. Um, but the discussion is there, uh, and I think it's worth following it. Also, we know that the platforms are putting a lot of money to to lobby for their point of view uh, for this. So it's, I mean, there is a clear need to be very careful about it. Uh, and in a way, what happened during the, well, also like the whole discussion and the whole like discussion around the platform policies and the US uh, elections, I think is quite telling. So I would also share the view of the US experts on this that when the platforms start, I mean, they are like basically admitting that they are acting as like quite traditional in a way, media platforms responsible for their content and who are making editorial decisions on uh, a very prominent person who is posting something uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, um, and I think that this is like, uh, I mean, it is a change in the discussion where the platforms have 10 or 15 years, uh, very, um, you know, uh, like uh, convincingly stated that they are just information sharing platforms yeah. instead of media companies who are actually conducting a certain editorial policy. Uh, so this has been a change in the de debate uh, in understanding like where this should be going. Uh, but at the moment, you know, I am not an official EU spokeswoman uh, for this. Uh, so my only advice can be that just follow the debate where it's going. And, uh, and, and yes, I mean, try to influence that from your point of view. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you also for... So I have also another question, uh, perhaps for Nandita and Oikum, as you are a health misinformation fellow. So how should we actually handle uh, the hardcore and committed anti-vax groups? What, what are your suggestions? All right. When it comes to anti-vax groups, uh, that's a difficult question because no amount of data or facts or science is going to help that narrative because it's a very inbuilt psychological, I mean, the multiple factors playing at hand. So it's not going to be an easy task. They are ardent believers that what they believe is right. Um, so I think I will suggest that uh, the only way forward that I can see is that don't go by science, but go by stories. Change the frame of the argument. Do not go into their frame saying that, oh, look how many uh, sad stories has happened. In fact, we need to project uh, more positive stories with respect to how vaccines have been improving our lives and uh, especially the COVID-19 vaccines. And uh, even when we, talk, when we are talking about, obviously the uh, rebuttal is going to be on the adverse reactions with respect to COVID-19 vaccines. But like I said, it's going to be so much more difficult to show them the data. And the only way forward that I can see as of now is to handle it with better stories, more positive stories, and to say that uh, vaccines are going to save more lives. And I would just say that Next Thanksgiving, I hope they celebrate with their entire family and nothing happens to them because of either because of COVID or because of the vaccines. So I'll just restrict my debate towards stories. Thank you. Oikum, do you want to add something? 
Uh, actually, uh, it's a very sensitive uh, area. Uh, as I said before, uh, we have to be calm and restrained uh, in persuading people because this can create some kind of backfire effect. Uh, I think uh, it would be a good solution to increase the visibility of those who are vaccinated and remain healthy. Because here uh, we need to focus on the stories of uh, the people and uh, why do they believe this? How can they be convinced? And I think we should focus on uh, such areas. Uh, for example, uh, one of the uh, anti-vaccination uh, supporter said that um, she needs to hear more voices from scientists, not from uh, the people from social media or from the television or, you know, from the uh, something who creates uh, a, any claims. Like, I think we should focus on science and health literacy. Thank you, Akum. Uh, I would like to also ask Maggie um, about foreign policy implications of COVID-19 disinformation and also about the influence of Russia uh, on when it comes to disinformation, uh, COVID-19 disinformation in Georgia and on, on, and on Georgian politics. Uh, yes, uh, I, I have partly covered this topic during my presentation, um, and this is the point I make that this uh, COVID-19 disinformation, specifically in Georgia, definitely has uh, foreign policy applications, uh, which means that um, according to the research carried out by our uh, institution, uh, mainly pro-Russian information sources were spreading the disinformation related to COVID-19. This different this information had different directions. For instance, one kind of disinformation promoted uh, this anti-Western narrative, arguing that the West, uh, specifically the European Union, uh, cannot help Georgia in crisis while Russia can do this. So by promoting this narrative, um, this disinformation sources were arguing that Georgia's economic dependence on Russia should increase. Uh, and another um, uh, narrative was also so anti-Western, uh, um, promoting this disinformation uh, and myths that um, uh, coronavirus was artificially created by the United States at the Richard Luger Laboratory in Tbilisi. So yes, in Georgia, uh, this uh, COVID-19 disinformation definitely has um, uh, political and foreign policy applications and if we talk about specifically about Russian disinformation we can see that uh, it also has uh, this foreign policy implications on local level I mean um, uh, if we look at the narratives targeted at local Russian audience uh, it also promotes this um, anti-Western, anti-democratic uh, myths and narratives arguing that um, uh, non-democratic countries such as China, for instance, are more effective in um, fighting against pandemic uh, than the democratic countries. Yeah. Thank you. Would somebody like to add something to the topic uh, related to foreign policy implications, perhaps in your countries? No, okay. So uh, I would like to also ask you, um, what do you think, um, what groups are falling for the disinformation and aiding the spread? This is the question for all of you. So I don't know if perhaps uh, Matthew could start. What do you think, which groups are, are mainly falling for disinformation? Well, it's, it's a very complex problem because it's a lot of groups in a lot of uh, people behind the dis disinformation and people that are targeting for the disinformation. It's, it's that's what one thing I've been thinking about as I listen to all these great speakers is a very complex issue because there are sort of states involved in disinformation for geopolitical reasons and they have all kinds of 
political objectives they're trying to meet. But, but what we have seen, as I described in the presentation over the last couple of years, are all, any number of groups now using the same tactics. They're, they're, they have the same tools available to them, and they're using the same tactics, the same procedures, but they're targeting uh, very discrete people for very specific purposes. It, it could be a commercial purpose. It could be a political purpose. It could be for no other reason than to cause mayhem. I mean, uh, there's, there's just so many angles to this. That's why we, we, we are going back to let's, let's, how, how do you, how do you set the foundational um, skills among young people or anybody, obviously, but starting with young people so that they can live in a world where they aren't constantly being uh, duped, uh, tricked, manipulated, uh, that they have some basic skills to protect themselves against any number of people with any number of agendas. I mean, this is not, again, new, it's not unusual, it's not surprising, um, but it's just more powerful than it has been in the past. That's our sort of hypothesis. And therefore, we have to get serious about teaching people how to deal with it in a very direct way, not, not a public information campaign that's on the internet, but reaching people directly, human contact with with strategies and skills that allow them to go about their lives and have a better chance of success. You won't, you won't help everybody uh, completely, 100%, but we have to do a much better job um, getting people to a basic level of awareness and some basic skills to go with that awareness so that they can you know, participate in the digital world and not be... Uh, you know, either part of the problem or promoting the problem or, or you know, otherwise harmed by disinformation. Thank you for your opinion. Um, would somebody like to add something to this also to this topic? I may add something. Sure. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a lot of research in this field, but I think there is no specific or single answer to this. So everyone uh, can really believe in misinformation. Uh, this situation uh, is not uh, related to age or education uh, in basically in Turkey. Uh, I'm about, uh, I, I think it's about the need of belief. Uh, I think people who are willing to believe anything uh, can also uh, fall for uh, misinformation and they can uh, help to uh, spread them. Thank you for your opinion. Yes, it's really difficult to, to understand what is real and what is false in this huge information stream on the internet. So uh, I don't know, do you want to add something to this discussion? Well, I, I, I would like to say yes? something. So, so we all have one of these, right? And this is the most powerful research tool that's ever been created, right? It's the uh, absolutely fantastic, brilliant thing that has all of the world's libraries, and museums and research papers uh, in it. And so whilst, you know, the mountain of misinformation has never been larger, and it's really easy to feel like we're drowning in a, in a sea of misinformation, it's also never been easier to fact check it. Um, but it does need a little bit of work. You need the skills and you need to put the work in. And, and I, I'm absolutely with you there, Matthew. And I don't just think it's teenagers. I think it's it's everybody, you know, if you're used to being spoon fed your information and it's easy, you know, there's a slogan that marketers use, convenience wins, right? Convenience wins. But convenience is going to kill you in this case because you, you just let your information be spoon fed to you and you end up getting in a smaller and smaller bubble. Disaster lies. It's never been easier to live in an unreal world. So it takes an effort to live in the real world. And we really need to encourage that in everybody mm. yes thank you for for your yeah, opinion just just sorry block just to jump mm -hmm. in I, I, sure john I, I think um you hit the nail on the head it's i'm so positive about this because i do believe that and that's why we, you know, we're focusing on teenagers not because that's where the problem exists the problem yeah. exists everywhere but it's it's a focus that we have because we see that's where the need is and i have a personal connection with my three teens for example yeah. um, but 
But I also very have a very positive view because it with some basic skills that are unusual or new to us here today, but won't be in the future, right? Yeah. Just like some basic skills on personal finance, how to balance a checkbook or, or what have you. You know, those are at some point new and unusual, but people, you know, societies get used to digital banking. So societies get used to all kinds of things. We're a very resilient species, but we have to uh, build that foundation. We, it's not automatic. You know, people aren't born with digital skills that, you know, they're, 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 bar, they're, they're far from it. They're, they're born with all the, 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 the qualities that make you a disaster online. You have to teach people how to conform to society in all number of ways, but now, especially in a digital way. And so these basic skills, I think, really are all that are required to take a lot of the energy away from the problem. And then a lot of it goes back into sort of what we experienced in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, state-sponsored disinformation campaigns. There still is a battle for ideas. There still is a battle for uh, control and for position and, and et cetera. But it will be less um, uh, acute if people have a greater sense of it, it's greater awareness and greater skills. I'd, I'd like to, sorry to boss it, I know I've had a bit more, too much air time, but there's one little story I'd, I'd like to tell. So uh, a few years ago, um, I did some volunteering at the site of the Grenfell Tower fire in London, which was a terrible disaster, high-rise tower block, caught on fire, killed well over 100 people, awful, awful uh, tragedy and disaster. And I did some volunteering there. And on the way home from doing some volunteering there, I was reading in the paper on the train the, one of the free newspapers they hand out in London on the train, Metro newspaper, and it's just a tiny little story at the top, and it said, baby found alive on 24th floor of Grenfell Tower. And this is a story, you see this story everywhere, there's earthquakes in Turkey, there's always a baby that's found alive underneath the rubble. We love these stories, newspapers love these stories, they're very heartwarming stories, and I thought, oh, that's just brilliant, absolutely brilliant, you know, and I thought, I can't wait to share that. Uh, uh, when I get home. And then I thought, because I'd already been working on this material for my workshop, I thought, hang on, I better just check that. I better do what I tell myself to do. I better just check this story. So I went on and I went to look to see if there were any other uh, newspapers or media outlets that were covering this story. And sure enough, none were. And I thought, this probably isn't real. And sure enough, two days later, Metro publishes an apology. They just ripped it off a Facebook post. Somebody trying to get hits it was a completely fake story. But my point is, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. But it did require me to stop and think and not take account of the emotional impact. So I think you made this point, Nandita and Oikum, to, to uh, actually share what I felt was a very uplifting tab, but it wasn't true. Thank you for the story. <laughs> Sorry, okay, sorry. So, so would you like to, uh, if there's somebody else who would like to add something, because we will be closing the discussion soon. So this is the space for you. If you want to add something or ask something, you can do it now. Thank you for your story, John. Uh, I will consider this. <laughs> okay, perfect. So thank you very much for participating in this discussion as well. Uh, so our webinar is getting to its end. And uh, I would like to thank to all of you, to all the speakers for a great presentation and also for amazing work that you are doing uh, in the fight against disinformation. Uh, also, I would, like to, I would like to thank to all the participants here on Zoom, of, of course, also on YouTube. I hope that it was interesting and that you have learned something new. Uh, please do not forget to follow us on social media uh, you big webinars and you can also uh, write us feedback we will also very appreciate this thank you very much again and uh, see you at the next webinar and have a great rest of the day thank, thank you, you very much thank, thank, you, thank you thank you